We'll do roll call in a, about 90 seconds here. Good morning, Cassia. Just checking to make sure you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Great, thank you. And Christy, just checking in if you've had a chance to um, confirm that you can hear us and if you'd like to unmute so that we can make sure we can hear you. Good morning and welcome to the continuation of the June 15, 16, 17, 22, and 24th non-statutory public hearing. I'd like to uh, uh, quickly do a roll call with members of council first to make sure that uh, everyone's here. Um, Councillor Paquette. Present. Good morning. Councillor Walters. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Councillor Banga. I'm present, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Katarina. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, uh, Councillor Zadik. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Essinger. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Henderson. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning, <clears throat> Councillor McKean. Good morning, Mr. Moore. Good morning, Councillor Nickel. Good morning. That's everybody. Welcome. Uh, see if I can get in the right video conference here. There we go. Okay, so members of council are all present and accounted for. Um, and welcome to uh, the speakers on panel 10. I will uh, quickly uh, roll call you in the same way just to make sure we can hear you and verify um, that you're with us uh, before we get started. But I'll first explain the uh, process for today's non-statutory public hearing on the referred motion regarding the Edmonton Police Commission. 
um, and, and maybe before uh, I outline the process, it is looking like, and we will consider a motion sometime today to this effect, that uh, we will complete the public hearing today um, and then uh, there won't be time to get into further questions or debate on the motion uh, or the many amendments I understand are, are being crafted. Um, that, that, that won't happen today and that won't happen this week. Uh, what we are uh, recommending uh, to Council, but also for the public's awareness, uh, will be that we uh, continue this discussion at 9.30 a.m. next Tuesday. Um, and that uh, most of that day, ideally all of that day, will be set aside for this discussion. So just so you have a sense of, of when this will continue, that's the earliest available uh, space we were able to free up in the Council calendar, uh, subject to the availability of uh, everybody who needs to be present for it. So um, Tuesday is when we expect to, to pick up the conversation that, that Council started a couple of weeks back, um, informed by uh, all of the feedback we've received uh, not just through the public hearing, we've also received a, a great deal of correspondence and, and other public commentary. Um, but we still have, I think, 49 more people to hear from today, and we're grateful to each of you for making time for us. Um, so the way this will work is that speakers have been paneled and will present to Council in the order in which they registered with the City Clerk. Each speaker will be given five minutes to speak. The Clerk will run a timer in the room, but you may wish to have your own timer to pace yourself accordingly. Once you've finished speaking, please mute your microphone, but stay on the line as Council may wish to ask you questions. After all, speakers within the panel have made their presentation. Each Councillor will be given up to five minutes to ask one round of questions of the presenters, if they wish. After each panel, a short recess will be called to allow us to set up for the next panel of presenters. If you wish to listen and follow along in the meeting after your panel is complete, you may, as always, do so using the live stream, which is available on edmonton.ca slash meetings. This process, especially the virtual nature of it, does require patience to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has the opportunity to do so. One thing I will ask is please refrain from using the chat function during the meeting as it creates issues of decorum. Uh, it can provide unfair advantage um, at the expense of someone else who has the floor. And it can actually uh, uh, interfere technically with the live stream and create glitches. So please refrain from using the chat function. Additionally, remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. If you are experiencing any difficulties, the Office of the City Clerk does have extra resources on hand to facilitate communication uh, with participants. Please reach out to the City Clerks using the contact information that you received in the reply to your registration. A speakers list for each panel will be provided on edmonton.ca slash meetings for your reference. So first of all, and please make note of the order in which you're appearing here so that you're ready to unmute yourself when we come to you. Uh, first is Morgan Hoder, or Hodder from the Edmonton Renters Union. Morgan, are you there? Yes, hello. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Next is Christy Harcourt. We can see you, Christy, but uh, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, well, we'll um, attempt to support your participation here. Uh, so the clerks will follow up with you about instructions for how to do that. Um, three, uh, Christina Laban. It indicates to me here has withdrawn. So just double checking, there's no Christina. No, okay, number four is Stephanie Motley. Present. Good morning, welcome. Next is Natasha. Thank you. Next is Natasha Frizzik. I present, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you very much. Thanks. Six is Alexis Davila. Hello, present. Good morning, welcome. Uh, seven is Kayla Velthius Crows. Good morning. And uh, if I mispronounce your names, please feel free to correct me. I apologize in advance for any errors. 
Uh, number eight is Andrew Noakes. Hello, present. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. You, number nine is, is Simon Burke. Yes, hello, present. Good morning. Welcome. Number 10 morning. is Jonah uh, Elke or Elk. It's Elke. I'm here. Thank you. Elke. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, number 11 is Lindsay Schroeder. Sorry, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. Number 12 is uh, Rosa Eve Forges Jenkins. Yeah, present. It's uh, Rose Eva Forges Jenkins. Forges Jenkins. Thank you. Rose Eva. Gotcha. Well, thank you. Um, and number 13 is Cassia Hardy. Is Cassia oh, Hardy? Oh, present. Yeah, sorry. Super. Welcome. Uh, number uh, 14 is Sophie Pio. Yeah, it's Sophie Pio. Pio. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, number 15 is Tamar Dinner or Diner? Dinner, and I am present. Thank you. Tamar Dinner. Welcome. And number 16 is Irina Langreder. Good morning. I'm here. Welcome. Okay. So <clears throat> we have 15 panelists. Uh, you have, uh, as I indicated, up to five minutes each uh, and stand by for questions afterwards and that will take us through to the noon lunch break. So um, uh, Morgan Hodder, you have the floor. Okay, um, good morning. My name is Morgan Hodder. I use she, her pronouns and I am a resident of Ward 8. Um, today, I want to amplify Black Lives Matter YEG's demands and calling for Edmonton Police Services to be defunded. Um, as I've kept up with these hearings, I've noticed certain narrative patterns emerging from pro-police speakers, police themselves, and city council members. There's one pattern in particular that I feel is necessary to address today, and this is when white women who identify as wives, mothers, and daughters of cops um, defend the police in a relative's name. White women... We like to think that we're wholly innocent because we experience patriarchal oppression, but we are not. We are in fact weapons of the patriarchy when we endanger black people, indigenous people, and people of color through our defense and usage of the police system. Our feelings of protection and safety are predicated on the persecution of black and brown communities. Historically, we've always kept power in the hands of white men by denying their violence and enacting it alongside them. This is exactly what we are doing when we advocate in favor of policing. This is, in fact, what trustees did in voting to keep SROs in schools yesterday, and when trustee Cheryl Johnner argued that we need cops in schools to protect white children from black and brown refugee children. Her and other trustees' refusal to defund the police, um, along with the other trustees who voted in favor of suspending SROs and never called trustee Johnner out on her racism, continues this work that quite literally puts black and, black and brown lives in danger. It is true that no one is free until we are all free, because systems of law enforcement create environments conducive to sexual violence, the very violence we white women claim police protect us from. I hope we've all heard the statistic that at least 40% of police officers commit domestic violence against their family members, in contrast to 10% of people in the general population. What's more, these abusive officers are rarely fired or held accountable. So even if your police husband or police father isn't abusive, even if you feel that he's a good person, the institution he contributes to is one that cultivates a space where racist to gendered violence is permissible and accepted. Furthermore, a 2017 study conducted by the Globe and Mail indicates that 10% of sexual assaults reported in Edmonton are dismissed as unfounded. In Canada, only 34% of sexual assault complaints lead to a charge, and even if one's abuser is charged, they enter a prison system that perpetuates cycles of gendered violence. That is, policing and an extension prison systems are not survivor-centered. They are rather colonial institutions that disproportionately remove Black people, Indigenous people, and people of colour from their communities. As a survivor of sexual abuse myself, I can tell you that calling the police to protect me was never an option. I'd heard too many stories of women being re-traumatized during the reporting process, and I did not want to risk going through that. I feel like Save Edmonton's letter to City of Edmonton elected officials articulates my thoughts on this, so I'm going to quote them. Quote, 
Policing practices fail to bring justice for victims and survivors and even increase trauma symptoms. We know that sexual violence and anti-Black racism are interconnected issues in a settler colonial society that values domination, control, and forms of hierarchical power. The result is a policing system where survivors and victims are not believed and are responsibilized for their own experience, thus exposing them to further violence, especially in the case of Black and Indigenous people. Police don't keep, keep communities safe. It is a reactive system that will never address the root causes of sexual violence, end quote. We will only have a rape-free society when systems of settler colonial patriarchy are dismantled, and this includes Edmonton Police Services. This is why I stand with BLM Yeg in demanding that City Council immediately defund Edmonton Police Services. I want to work towards the abolition of police because I know these institutions only perpetuate and exacerbate gendered and racially motivated violence. And in closing, I do want to directly address the white women of this council. We are colonizers too, not just white men. And refusing to defund the police after you've made black people, indigenous people, and people of color to do all of this labor for you is an act of settler colonial violence. So instead, let's allocate funds to communi community building initiatives and organizations that will benefit all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Christy Harcourt, are you able to unmute yourself now? We do have staff working with her to work through the IT issues. Okay, we'll see if we can come back to uh, Christy. Next would be Stephanie Motley. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, okay good. Sorry, I can't see you, so I wasn't sure. Um, good day, council members, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak and address you today. I want to start by saying the pro prospect of defunding or abolishing the police is one of the most unwise, irresponsible proposals by the city to date. I believe that this notion is nothing more than an emotional reaction to the politicizing of current social events. The calls for justice are understandable, the calls for change and are necessary, the targeting of Edmonton police, however, is not. To defund the police would bring disastrous consequences and would affect the safety of our city and its residents. If defunding happens, a lot of officers will potentially lose their jobs because the budget cut will not be able to support our already short-staffed police service. Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee says the movement to defund police risks reversing the service's stride toward becoming a more diverse organization. Defunding police would mean laying off younger officers who tend to be more diverse and attuned to modern policing ideas. Statistics provided show the, ser the service's hiring of unrepresentative groups, including women, Indigenous people, visible minorities, and LGBTQ individuals, has improved in the last five years. The EPS 2019 recruit class is made up of 57.1% of underrepresented groups, compared to only 41.9% five years previous in 2015 to defund would undo the progress that many are seeking. Defunding the police would also re result in increased wait times for the residents of Edmonton. Police in Canada respond to a, almost 13 million calls for service, with EPS responding to approximately one call every three minutes, 24 hours per day. The reality is that the demand for policing service keeps growing, which is why budgets keep expanding. Crime will not take a back seat because we choose to defund police. It will always be present. Serious incidents are already, giving, are already given priority, but defunding could result in wait times for things like break and enters, taking hours for police to respond if they can even respond at all. I think police are frustrated with the system right now, too. If the argument is that police shouldn't be the, first, the agency of first resort for mental health calls or wellness checks, then I believe police are in complete agreement. Playing the part of social worker is not and should not be expected of police, yet police are often called and expected to fill this role. The argument has also been made that if we defund the police and transfer these funds to other organizations, like including social workers, that it will be better and safe for everyone. The issue I have with this is that police are often called to these scenes to make sure it is safe for social workers and other organizations to enter. The reality is that there will always be a need for police response when public safety is in jeopardy. That will not change, even if other social services are expanded to meet demand. We need to recognize that the overwhelming majority of calls, whether wellness checks or mental health service calls, are, are being handled professionally and with escalation, without escalation by officers who are well-trained. The complete lack of knowledge shown by those who are petitioning for defunding and abolition of police shows they have absolutely no idea what they are talking about. They refer to police equipment as toys, among other insults. 
Defunding of the police would take away necessary life-saving equipment needed by the police, such as helicopter, such as the police helicopter that is used many times in locating missing and lost persons. I have been stunned and concerned with the constant media coverage which has been labeling policing in Canada as a racist and broken system. I've struggled to understand that the public backlash at officers in Canada for the overwhelming majority of police officers who on a daily basis conduct themselves with professionalism, empathy, and compassion, seeing a constant stream of personal attacks directed their way would undoubtedly affect their own mental health. Although I can appreciate the statistics and acknowledge that these things do exist, we can do better. I do believe that the blame shouldn't be laid at the feet of police based solely on a media-driven effort to undermine police officers. I would like to reiterate something that our EPS police chief has said, that Edmonton is not an American police force. In closing, we need the police, and defunding would be a disastrous move. I can agree that something needs to change, but it needs to go further than simply removing funds from the police. Possibilities such as exploring collaborations would, in fact, likely require more funding. I dare you to look into the eyes of a citizen that has been a victim of criminal activity or a crime in our community and tell them that our city will be a safer place if we remove funding for police. Thank you. <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Motley. Ms. Harcourt, are you there? You can unmute yourself. There we go. Yes, I am. Go Thank ahead. you. Sorry about that. No worries. The floor is yours for five minutes. Proceed. Thank you. My name is Christy Harcourt. I'm a social worker and educator. Born in Edmonton, I live in Inglewood in Ward 2. I was raised to have and show a deep respect to police and with an awareness of my namesake, a family friend and career member of the EPS, Chris Christie Braden. What I've come to know living in the LGBTQ and 2S communities and working in the inner city neighborhoods is that my experience with police is deeply shaped by, by, by my being white, middle class and fairly gender conforming. For many friends and clients of all ages, police represent the opposite of safety particularly for peers who are Indigenous, Black or Brown, who are trans or two-spirit, or whose lives leave them seeking a safe place to be when home or foster home or group home or shelter isn't safe, police are not safe. I've walked alongside countless people whose exposure to police involved being carded, moved along, made unwelcome, harassed, threatened. Because of systemic issues, when people are hurt, involving police often worsens harm rather than relieving it as police involvement leads to misgendering in the courts, to higher rates of incarceration, and to harsher unsafety in remand. Perhaps because of my upbringing, I've tried repeatedly to support police partnerships and to work within systems to change the course of policing, including taking part in the Police Commission's street check review, the results of which the then chief reinterpreted and dismissed. It's time to try something different. The EPS budget is 10 times that of FCSS, which supports 90 agencies. Divesting funds could allow communities to explore what safety means for them and create room for diverse communities to look after ourselves. EPS officers are being put into roles they are misaligned with, leaving everyone vulnerable. The motion before council should be rejected because it is insufficient. Funding should be diverted from the EPS budget and into community-based initiatives. The EPS budget reveals that the city has funds. We as a city are choosing to direct those funds into policing rather than into community-based methods of care that provide a safer, could provide a safer safety net for more Edmontonians. I'm one of the organizers of an annual dance and agency fair for LGBTQS, LGBTQ2S teens called the Queer Youth Prom. Each year on the first Friday in May in a rented City of Edmonton facility, about 500 teens two dozen community groups, 100 volunteers, four drag queens, and one DJ make magic together. Every year, the venue manager asks about police and how we'll keep our events safe. Our response is to share an extensive safety plan and explain that for our community, the presence of police would damage rather than contribute to a feeling of safety. A key component of the safety of our event for the youth we invite is the absence of police. So how does our community create safety together? We sow accountability between the participants. Teens who attend are aware of the rules and respect them. The organizers provide safety measures to avoid theft and prevent the event being targeted. And the community comes together, a hundred strong, to keep everyone safe and well. Queer Youth Prom is just one event, just one night a year, and a tiny example of how the community can organize and care for itself. 
I request that Council begin a process of reducing the EPS budget and diversing, diverting these funds into community supports and community-based solutions that build greater ownership and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Natasha Frizik. Hi there. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Basically what Christy said. Anyway, hi, my name is Natasha Frizik. I use she, her pronouns, and I live in Ward 7. I am an active member of my union, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers Local 730, where I also serve as a delegate to the Edmonton District Labour Council. This motion as it stands does not go far enough. I am in favor of council enacting the demands put forth on the Black Lives Matter Edmonton website and defunding the police as quickly as possible as it is an urgent matter. Council, reinvest that $383 million budget into new grassroots infrastructure that prioritizes community safety for Black, Indigenous, and otherwise marginalized communities using these principles. Do not vote to increase the EPS budget. Immediately repeal the $75 million budget increase promised to the EPS in 2019. Since Edmonton police have confirmed 30% of their workload is managing mental health, addiction, and other social challenges, it follows that a minimum 30% of the police budget should be immediately redirected to professionals trained in handling any crisis related, but not limited to mental health, substance abuse, children and family matters, healthcare, homelessness, and challenges engaging youth in schools. Rather than investing in policing, prioritize free public transit, create municipally run safe injection site infrastructure, build free non-coercive drug and alcohol treatment facilities, increase funding to the crisis diversion team with no police involvement, expand 211 to include neighborhood-based crisis intervention and de-escalation training, making mobile dispatch of these services available 24-7. Create universal design low-income housing, expand the LRT lines to all Edmonton area municipalities, and create channels for municipal property to be returned to Indigenous councils and organizations for their own sovereign use. Additionally, immediately undertake a mass public campaign about calling 211. We did it with COVID and we can do it for emergency social services. This is not a comprehensive list of all the demands clearly laid out on the Black Lives Matter YAG website, and I'm sure if you haven't already, you will take the time to read them thoroughly. I also want to draw your attention to a statement recently released to my union's president, Roland Schmidt, uh, released by my union's president, Roland Schmidt, entitled Solidarity Against Racism and State Violence. The labor, the labor movement knows well the oppression that government and police are willing to inflict, uh, inflict on those demanding justice. Not long ago, our own union was painfully reminded that constitutional rights only exist as long as they don't inconvenience the powerful. If we had dared to defy this authority, police boots and fines would be there to remind us of our place in the world. Although individual police are often recruited from the working class, their group interests as an institution are unconditionally hostile to the empowerment of the rest of the working class and especially unions. If any other group of people behave the way police do and have during the resulting global protests, they'd be labeled as criminal organizations. Defunding the police is a powerful first step in realigning the power dynamics influencing our communities and oppressing our most vulnerable. Council members, during these hearings, you have heard and will continue to hear expert testimonials, analysis, and well-researched advice from Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, and even white people demanding you abolish the police and reinvest that money into community. What a gift you have been given. So many have given you their unpaid time, research, resources, and stories to guide you in your decision. Mayor Iveson made mention a few times last week that he knows members of the EPS are feeling very attacked. So here's my offering to white EPS members and white council members alike. If you find you are doing your job with fear, be it policing or deciding on behalf of your constituents how to fund or indeed defund policing, let's talk. Let's talk about our white fragility and ingrained white supremacy 
and let's examine why we white people are so afraid of our own discomfort <clears throat> and the violence and racism that defensiveness perpetuates. I am 100% serious that if you don't have another white person in your life you can discuss these things with, I will be that white person for you. Mayor Iveson, I will email you my contact information and I will trust you will share it with wise discretion. Thank you, I yield my time. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Freizek, uh, for that generous offer. Um, <clears throat> we'll make sure that the city clerk circulates it to members of council. So, uh, confidentially, of course. Um, uh, Alexis Davila is next. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. Hello, my name is Alexis. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a second generation Philippinex immigrant and settler living on Treaty 6 territory. I currently reside on Ward 8. On June 17, Council updated the media on the public hearings City Council has been holding on community safety and policing. It was made known that personal stories and testimonies regarding police moved to Council members to find the right solution. Being moved is very different from understanding and living the embodied experience of these stories and testimonies. How can you truly police and govern a community that you do not fully engage with? Oftentimes, it is bottom-up versus top-down argument of politics, but to achieve meaningful political change, it has to happen both at the grassroots and systemic institutional level. On Wednesday, June 14th, Ray Cash Walters talked to Council about participatory budgeting and co-design for safety initiatives. For those who are not familiar, participatory action is an approach to research in communities that emphasize participation and actions. It seeks to understand the world by trying to change it collaboratively with those marginalized and most affected, following deep reflection and reflexivity of personal biases. If we hope to break down systemic issues, we need to be wary of the instruments that contribute to the system, which includes council debating and deciding ways to move forward in defunding the police and community safety without the participation of the communities that are most vulnerable, Black and Indigenous peoples. We must break down the instruments of racism and colonialization in every step and include black and indigenous people, not as consultants or speakers at a public hearing, but as agents of change. Imagine, instead of trying to learn and gain knowledge, insight and experience of people to later in implement policies for them, we let them create solutions that we would never think of in thousands of years. Our knowledge keepers are in the community. They live and embody experiences every day to truly emphasize and understand historical trauma. They are the evidence-based solution because despite systemic racism, colonization, they are here today, alive, breathing, and still fighting what needs to be done and with dignity. Council, yes, we must defund the police and reallocate the funds for other forms of community safety. However, this will not be achieved with your learning of trends and advice of experts alone. I urge you to change the motion to not just include the engagement of external subject matters experts to bring a um, report summarizing trends and change models, 1B, but to provide agency and decision-making power to Black and Indigenous and otherwise marginalized people of this community, Treaty 6 territory. To summarize, instead of the current structure of advisement to Council for them to deliberate and provide solutions, I propose we put Black and Indigenous community leaders in decision-making positions regarding community safety and therefore their safety. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Kayla Velthius cruz Hello. What I'm about to share is a story of homelessness and poverty, mental illness and addiction, and how those experiencing these circumstances are vulnerable to police mistreatment and incarceration. I hope by sharing this story, I can bring awareness that to the gaps that exist in the social safety net and the human costs that these gaps can have. My brother suffered paranoid delusions. He was given medication to treat this. He was also homeless. Imagine having no home, no schedule, and no regular meals. And imagine having a mental illness that convinced you that there was a network of evil forces that were watching you and waiting to hurt you. The stress of these delusions are compounded by the fact that you are treated differently by the police. You can't remember if you took your medication this morning. You take another one or maybe you skip it. Either way, your brain doesn't know how to cope with what you're feeding it at irregular intervals. It causes confusion and you just want to numb yourself from the suffering of your daily reality. You steal a bottle of whiskey and the police are called. 
You're held at the remand until you can be seen by the court. Months pass. You start making plans for when you get out, and you start dreaming of the day that you can be reunited with your daughter. You're released from jail in the fall. There's a bite in the air that reminds you how crucial it is that you find a home and a job. You go to the library and print resumes off and hand them out. You're not qualified for some jobs. Other jobs just don't like that nervous shift in your eyes that you've developed after years of being dismissed by society. Maybe they're just uncomfortable with a native working in their store. A peace officer asks what you're doing in the mall and escorts you out. Your stuff got stolen last night at the shelter while you were sleeping. You're ashamed that your plan is failing so quickly and you're scared you're being watched again. You steal another bottle. This time you're picked up for being drunk and disorderly in public. You think back to all the other times you interacted with the police. You think back to Christmas when you went to see a movie with your family and you went out for a cigarette alone. The police questioned you as to why you were there. They're preparing to bring you back downtown when your dad comes out and vouches for you. Their tone shifts. You're both bid a good night. Why did it take a white man's word for the police to believe you? You remember the time you were out at the family home. A cat got out late at night. You and your brother went looking for him. The police were called and you and your brown-skinned brother ended up on the ground with knees in your back while your white-skinned cousin stood there aghast, explaining that these two natives were okay to be there. You remember another time that you gave in to your addiction and got booked for breach of probation. The officers who held you used you as target practice with their tasers. They laughed until they were told to knock it off. A few more months in jail and your family breathes out knowing that you won't succumb to the harsh winter elements, at least not this year. They wonder why is it that they feel that jail is the safest place for you. Jail is a place to hold criminals, and yet it feels like the safest place for you. Why is that? You're released after a few months and the cycle continues. This time you're picked up by the cops to deal because they were called to deal with a drunk with no shoes and no shirt laying on a bench. The police were called on a man clearly in need of care and the police arrested you. You're in violation of your probation again. You're brought to a police station where you receive two separate health checks and clear for custody both times. The third time, concerns were raised and you're rushed to the ICU. Your family was called. Your brain had a bleed in it. Such a serious injury ensured your death. Your family held your hands as machines did your breathing for you and kept your organs alive. The police stayed outside the room, except for one who stationed himself in the room as your family cried over your lifeless body. You died the same way you lived much of your 20s in police custody. Six months later, the Black Lives Matter movement comes to Edmonton following the death of George George Floyd. His death reminds me of you. I remember all the times you told me that you were treated cruelly by the police. I remember your delusions too. How much of the police interactions you suffered, how much did the police interactions that you suffered breed your mistrust of authority and feed into your psychosis? I wonder if you would still be here if you weren't treated differently by society because you were skin color, if you weren't put in jail every time you tried to self-medicate with alcohol. I come back to the question, why did it feel feel like jail was the safest place for you? Why did nobody see that you needed help, not jail? Where is the safety net for you? How many lives could be saved if we had more resources to allocate to mental health and addiction crises? What difference would it make were you treated like a man experiencing a health crisis rather than a chronic criminal? How much did your skin color, your rap, your rap sheet, and your lack of home affect the care that you received on the day that you were picked up by the police and later died? I don't have any answers, only questions. Thank you. Next is Andrew Noakes. Hello, Andrew here. Very moving story by Kayla. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Andrew Noakes. I use uh, he and him pronouns. I reside in Ward 8 on Treaty 6 territory, now known as Edmonton. I stand with the Edmonton area Black Lives Matter chapter and demand that their calls for city council to defund the police be met. Uh, the Edmonton Police Service, as stated before, there are 38 sorry, $383 million budget should be reinvested to new grassroots infrastructure, organizations, and community leaders that prioritize community safety for Black, Indigenous, and otherwise marginalized communities. Reinvesting that $75 million budget 
currently promised into affordable housing, mental health care programming, and community-led organizations. The success of these programs lies in following the lead of the already existing community members working within this infrastructure. One of the fundamental and immediate ways to defund the police is to eliminate the student resource officer program in all schools immediately. As a teacher, I believe the elimination of the SRO program is an essential step in creating an environment to foster success for all students, especially Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ2A plus students. Students of color experience disproportionate violence and criminalization. Officers show students how institutionalized racism works against these people, Black and Indigenous students, by arresting students allocating costly fines and implicating students in entrapment programs such as the BAIT cell phone program. The SRO program not only acts as an extension of the greater policing system by denying students access to education in a safe and inclusive learning environment, but may also contribute to the Canadian school to prison pipeline. Instead of making schools safer, it infuses their learning with trauma from past experience. Creating barriers for full access and participating in participation in education, deterring black and indigenous students from pursuing higher education. The Edmonton School Board currently pays the Edmonton Police Service 50% of school resource officers' salaries. As an educator, I find this alarming. This is a completely inappropriate use of school funds. Without paying those costs, the Edmonton Public Schools can provide more educational assistance, advocacy workers, mental health care professionals, success coaches, youth mentorships, and more that would better support our students. We need to create safe spaces and student groups that serve Black and Indigenous youth. Funds are needed to do that instead of continuing the criminalization of our youth. If you need further evidence to eliminate the SRO program, look to the Toronto District School Board who abolished their SRO program in 2017 and the Black Lives Matter Edmonton chapter for concrete examples and advice. I have drawn from these sources today. Elected officials, please take this information into account upon moving forward. Even though the EPSB board discussed this on Tuesday, it still is important to keep the discussion moving within city council and all school boards Students need mentors that they decide to follow and not police officers that are forced upon them. Thank you for your time, and I, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Noakes. Next is Simon Burke. Hi, uh, I'm Simon Burke. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me here and listening. Um, I live in Ward 11. I'm represented by uh, Councillor Walters, who I'm happy to say I voted for, along with you, Mayor Iveson. It's a, a, been a joy to follow along with this hearing. Um, but uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm missing from this conversation is the, the case for abolition. And that's what I'm going to try to do here. I'm gonna, I'll try to go really fast. I've got a lot, and you know, five minutes isn't, isn't a lot of time. So um, Mayor Iveson has said he is uh, on board with delivering a more just, preventive, uh, inclusive policy. Uh, Chair, uh, Police Commission Chair uh, Mickey Ruth said, changes we make must be large and sustainable. Uh, when, I, when I hear the word sustainable, I think about, uh, I think about food security, I think about um, alleviating poverty, I think about, um, actually I think about permaculture and uh, like, you know, uh, community gardening initiative. I'm a volunteer at my uh, Blue Quill Community League. We're an EFCL member. Um, and, you know, we just got started with our community garden uh, about a month ago. It's been excellent, but, you know, we don't have... We, we, we fundraise. We, we're we tripartite. We get money from the city and from the provincial government, but we also rely on fundraising, much like we do when I volunteer to support my local MLA, who is wonderful, uh, unlike my MP. Um, Chief McPhee is, can we acknowledge it's weird to call him Chief McPhee? I mean, okay. Um, so he says systemic racism has existed for many years. It dates back longer than anyone in this room or on the phone. We have done considerable work, but still considerable work to be done. This work needs to be done and we cannot miss this opportunity. Uh, this must be a catalyst for real meaningful change. Uh, we need to actually change the status quo uh, drive change. It is unanimous and it is a commitment. Uh, Chief McPhee 
says that 82% of the police budget right now is salary. He said that if we get if we we go through with this, if we carry this motion to not give the 75 million for the fiscal year starting in September, uh, he would have to fire his most recent 500 hires, which you know are a great diversity. Uh, Chief, Mc, Chief Dale McPhee said diversity is our biggest asset to drive change. Uh, one of my favorite abolitionists, Angela Davis, says diversity is a corporate strategy. It is designed to ensure that the institution functions in the same way that it functioned before with more black and brown faces. Um, Vision 2020 was huge, has been hugely successful balancing reducing demand with enforcement. Sorry, that's a quote from uh, McPhee. He, uh, let me go here. Um, so Chief McPhee says that Vision 2020 has been very successful with the cooperation of the community, has succeeded only with the community, working together to achieve results. We have to improve outcomes and um, reduce uh, calls for service. We have to reduce calls for service and improve outcomes. Well, of the 140 community agencies that he's referring to, I, I can't even imagine what those 140 community agencies could picture themselves doing with, say, $400 million. I mean, unlike the police, these community organizations haven't had the luxury to imagine up a use for a tank, or a helicopter, or, you know, $400 million. It's not really about the $75 million or this $400 million. It's about Edmonton being a pioneer in um, what is a global movement. Police are being abolished. Minneapolis certainly surprised us all by voting to disband. Seattle right now is talking about their $400 million budget. They're talking about cutting, reducing that to $200 million, uh, just cutting it in half in... Um, I, they haven't set a time goal. I mean, I'm sure it might, might take two years, it might take five years. But Edmonton could be a leader here. We could be a leader or we can be on the wrong side of history, essentially. Uh, for too long, for too many communities, the police have not been what we hope they are. And I, I don't think it's a matter of there being good cops or bad cops. It's not bad apples. It's policing itself that is the issue. Uh, we're very fortunate in Edmonton. I mean, I've been thrilled with Chief McPhee. We, we're very lucky to have such good police here, but what, what does justice look like for Rodney Levy, who the RCMP shot and killed last week? What, what does justice look like for any, any of these victims of police violence or police brutality? And, and it's, it's not just the EPS, we're talking about the EPS budget here, but there's still, there's the peace officers, there's the RCMP, there's the, the county sheriff's office, there's all kinds of enforcement, CBP, um, there, there's seemingly no end to it. Uh, so if we want to talk about working together to achieve results, sure, I can agree with uh, Chief McPhee that um, six to eight million dollars for body cams, maybe he d that's not effective. Sure. I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, I can't agree that SROs are positive. I'm afraid uh, that your time is up. Oh, that's fair. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, though. There may be some questions for you, though. So uh, stand by. Um, I'll stick around. Next is... Um, that was Mr. Burke, right? So next is yes, Jonah Elke. Hi there, my name is Jonah. Um, my pronouns are he and they. I live in Ward 7, and I've lived on this land that we know as Edmonton for 12 years. I was recently working for a restorative justice program that worked with youth. I was working with a young person, a teenager, a child, who had been charged with assaulting an officer. When you hear that, as I did, you probably think that this person threw a punch, maybe they used bear spray at an officer. No, this young person, this child, spat at a cop, and their spit didn't even land on the officer. They were charged for assaulting an officer. It's wild to me that there's a profession where you were protected by this kind of law. There are plenty of public servants who get spit on on a daily basis. My partner is a teacher who works with kids with severe behavior disorders. She gets spit at all the time. Students have punched her in the face and threatened her with weapons. 
She usually de-escalates these situations without even touching the student. She makes less money than an entry-level EPF officer, and she's been teaching for five years. When my partner gets spat on, she lets the youth calm down, and they have a conversation about what happened. When the young person I worked with spat at a police officer, a spit shield was placed over his face, and he was physically restrained on the ground by two officers. He was punished, even though his spit did not land anywhere on the officer. He was punished for disobeying, not for doing harm. Our justice system is a punitive system. A punitive system operates under the belief that there are rules for our behavior and people who break these rules should be punished. Restorative justice is a contrast to punitive justice. In restorative justice, all crime is viewed in terms of hurt relationships. Restorative justice is based in part on indigenous justice systems from Canada and from New Zealand. It was the way justice worked for some communities on these lands before Turtle Island was colonized. Restorative justice has been offered as a way of decreasing police budgets by diverting some situations back to communities. A similar process has already occurred within youth justice. Restorative justice programs work well at supporting youth accountability, but they fall apart when they interface with the court. The courts see the most valuable outcomes of restorative justice, which are the rebuilt relationships, as, to quote a Crown prosecutor, too airy-fairy for the court to consider valuable. I've already seen that in a system that contains both restorative and punitive justice, restorative justice isn't taken seriously. This punitive justice system isn't interested in accountability or in righting wrongs. I don't believe restorative justice is an appropriate adjunct to our current policing. In our current system, people who make mistakes fear for their livelihoods and for their lives. Punitive systems create a culture of shame because taking accountability means punishment. People can't be accountable if they don't feel safe. Accountability is something EPS has struggled with themselves through their handling of the racist carding practices in 2017 and presently, in their inability to address systemic racism in any substantive way. If someone tells you your actions have hurt them, taking accountability looks like listening, investigating, and making changes to address the harms you've caused. In fact, there's no way for EPS to monitor their progress on their anti-racism efforts because they aren't analyzing data about racism within their force, as far as I know. Through the investigation into carding, EPS was given a perfect chance to change their racist behavior, and they did not. I don't believe they will, primarily because EPS has shown an inability to take accountability for their actions. In restorative justice, it's up to our communities, not the victims of our actions, to hold us accountable. In EPS's case, their community is you, Mr. Iveson, and you, city councillors. People who have been disproportionately affected by police's discriminatory behaviors are telling you that this is a problem, it is up to you to hold EPS accountable. The police commission is not providing sufficient oversight. You city councillors are not providing sufficient oversight. Do you want to live in a world where an armed police force can attack and sometimes kill civilians with minimal oversight and no accountability? I don't believe any noticeable change will occur without an utter transformation of justice on municipal, provincial, and federal levels. This goes beyond simply defunding the police. We need to work to abolish police in Edmonton. I believe that true reconciliation will be impossible until white people are willing to take accountability for our actions and admit that we have been complicit in deli a deliberately racist system of which police are the enforcers. I urge you, Mr. Iveson and councillors, to reflect on whether you would like to continue to fund and tacitly endorse system systemic racism in the city. At the very least, I think you should take BLM Yegg's motion seriously, and I think you should eliminate the SRO program immediately. Did you hear what that EPSB trustee said? about protecting white kids from refugee kids? Ridiculous. Yeah, tell me again that systemic racism isn't an issue here. I recommend you think about this while sitting in youth court. I think they're reopening on July 6th. Maybe being surrounded by literally 100 racialized children being unempathetically punished for minor infractions will inspire you to think critically about policing. For me, a safe city is a city without cops. I stand with BLM Yegg. Please defund and eventually dissolve Edmonton Police Service as soon as possible. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Lindsay Schroeder. Sorry. My family is worried about me speaking today. With police members being attacked and threatened in our streets, most of the people I know feel they're in danger if they show any opposition to defunding the police. While I truly believe that our social services and outreach programs require more funding and should be doing some of the calls that EPS go to, I also don't believe that abolishing EPS is the answer. When we have 
Sorry, not all police are racist and not all racists are police. The discrimination discrimination exists everywhere in the city and that needs to end everywhere in the city. When I was in elementary school, I was involved in a situation that required a 911 call. Our adult neighbor had grabbed the oldest of our group, a 12 year old boy and physically assaulted him. While pinning this child to the ground by his neck, he called to his son to go into the house to grab a knife. When my mother heard what was going on, she called 911 immediately and gathered us around the front step. This individual then decided to get into his van and at full speed, he drove across our lawn in the attempts to hit 13 elementary school children. Police arrived shortly and they did de-escalate the situation. And to this day, I remember the relief I felt when I saw the police car arriving and I felt safe and protected because this man could no longer hurt me. If EPS hadn't arrived that day and didn't have the resources to do so, I don't know what would have happened. Would a neighbor have stepped in? Doubtful, not one neighbor came out of their house that day while many looked on. And would they have been de would they have been effective in de-escalating the situation, or th would they have just ended up in the line of fire as well? I hear many people saying that police strictly react to crime and do not prevent crime, but I feel putting murderers, child abusers, rapists, gang members, pedophiles, and violent criminals that do exist in our city behind bars to prevent them from re from reoffending is in fact preventing crime. As a survivor of sexual abuse as a child and rape as an adult, I am so glad that EPS can get those kinds of people off the street. I hear many speaking to entirely rid Edmonton of the police force, and I believe they do so because they enjoy a privilege of not knowing how much violent crime is in our city. Until we live in a world with no rapists, pedophiles, gangs, and any person willing to harm others, we require police. Until no undercover police officer has to sit in a room with a headless body while undercover with a gang, or stay cool as he follows a man to the grave of that man's own father who he murdered, we need police. Crimes like these are not few and far between, but a daily reality in our city. One of the main functions of the police helicopter is to reduce the need for high-speed chases that endanger not only civilians and police officers, but the offenders themselves. It's not meant to militarize the police. It's meant to, to end and reduce high-speed chase-related fatalities and injuries. Again, I feel those enjoying the privilege of police protection sometimes aren't aware of these things. A budget cut that leaves EPS short, even more short staff scares me. The last budget cut and hiring freeze that EPS weathered resulted in the death of an officer. Ezio Ferron was a member of the EPS tactical unit, a unit that's designed to handle situations where the level of violence and risk is very high. Ezio responded to a robbery, an armed robbery in a mandatory one man car. And as a result, my father carried his casket. We cannot allow past mistakes to be repeated. His death should not be in vain. We should not have to attend the funerals of those we love because they were left unprotected. Tomorrow marks the 30th anniversary of Ezio's ultimate sacrifice. Please remember Ezio because his life mattered. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. Next is Rose Eva Forges Jenkins. Forges Jenkins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great job, Don. You got it this time. Okay. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rose Eva Forges Jenkins. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a white settler living in Ward 8. I want to thank everyone who's worked so hard to create the space for dialogue at city council meetings. I feel like I've learned so much from so many amazing people in the space of these meetings. And I specifically wanted to thank the black, indigenous, and other racialized individuals who shared their stories, as well as Black Lives Matter Edmonton for organizing around this. 
I wanted to say how inspired I am to see so many people and so many young, young people especially who are actively participating with city politics in a way that I've never seen before. I hope that city council meetings in the future are able to be as accessible as these live streamed and closed captioned sessions have been. <clears throat> I also wanted to echo the sentiments of many before me. I demand the city council immediately reduce the police budget by a minimum of 30% and eliminate the SRO program and to also begin community consultations to ask racialized folks in Edmonton what they want the future of community safety to look like. One of the groups that I demand that you consult is the city's anti-racism advisory committee. Mayor Don Iveson, in your blog post in response to the Black Lives Matter letter, letter to City Council, you mentioned that you wanted to see the immediate reactivation of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. <clears throat> I completely agree that this advisory committee needs to be reactivated. However, I believe that there are some major changes to this committee that need to take place. Because defunding the police is intertwined with the overarching goal of abolishing racist practices, I'm going to talk about what I want to see in terms of the role of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee within City Council. Currently, the, mand the mandate of the Anti-Racism Advisory Council is to make community recommendations to City Council and to conduct research and prepare reports on community-based concerns and uh, issues. Both this mandate and the terms of reference for this committee were created without consultation of the current anti-racism committee members and does not provide committee members an active enough role in city council. I suggest that this mandate and the terms of reference are reviewed with the current committee members and altered to reflect their recommendations. As you have heard many times by now, racism is systemic. If City Council is truly taking anti-racism initiatives seriously, members of this committee need to be able to review the work of City Council and make recommendations when it comes to decision-making uh, decision processes, such as what percentage of city funds should be allocated to EPS. Along with giving the Anti-Racism Committee a larger role in city decision-making processes, I also believe that they should be compensated for their labor. I've talked to people who are currently on the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee and they have confirmed with me that they are not getting paid to participate in this committee. I demand that members of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee be compensated for their labor immediately. Extracting the labor of racialized people who sit on this committee without compensating them is unacceptable. Without compensating committee members for their time, you are not valuing the importance of anti-racism work and not valuing the input of committee members while they share their deeply traumatic experiences with racism. I want you to give the Anti-Racism Advisory, Advisory Committee the power and tools to create effective change within the city and be able to take proactive steps towards making the city safer for racialized people. I don't want the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee to simply exist to make the, feel, the city feel as if, it's a, as if it's accomplishing its quota without actually giving members of the committee the tools that they need to analyze the structures contributing to anti-racism. I was very concerned to learn that the Anti-Racism Committee has not been consulted in EPS's role at any point. Though I very much appreciate having these city council meetings that we're doing right now, I am wondering why you are consulting consulting members of the public in terms of defunding the police and having many uh, racialized folks do a human, huge amount of labor to relay their traumatic experiences without first consulting your own anti-racism committee. To me, this points to a problem in the way that the anti-racism committee functions within city council, that it exists as a talking point to prove how inclusive city council is, but the input of this committee isn't being valued and implemented. The Anti-Racism Committee needs to be directly implicated in city decision-making rather than filling in a performative role for the city. If we are to believe that City Council is taking anti-racism seriously, the members of this advisory committee need to be given a larger role in city decision-making processes as well as be provided with compensation. I demand that you defund EPS by 30% immediately, end the SRO program, and give the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee a more active role in being able to advise on the systemic racism within the city's institutions. As Black Lives Matter has said, defund the police and reinvest in community. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak, and I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Cassia Hardy. Hello, counselors. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My name is Cassia Hardy. I am a 27-year-old woman 
raised in and soon returning to Ward 7 of the Miskachewiskahican, colonially known as Edmonton. I am here today to reject today's motion for being insufficient. I speak today in solidarity with Black Lives Matter Edmonton to urge council immediately begin to work towards abolishment, not merely defunding, abolishment of the Edmonton Police Service. This process begins with freezing the 2020 budget for the police. It continues with 30% of the budget being immediately reallocated to local initiatives supporting people facing mental health crises, as per Dale McPhee's statistic. This process concludes in complete abolishment before the 2021 civic election commences, as per Ms. Emily Riddle's timeline on Monday's panel. As recently as yesterday morning, we can see the shortcomings of an institution designed to isolate and punish instead of providing compassionate care and resources. A 40-year-old man whose name has not been released died in police custody on Tuesday morning after being arrested in South Edmonton. EPS protocol specifically mentions security check-ins every 15 minutes and so-called arousal checks every hour. Yet this person was found unresponsive hours after their arrest for being mentally unwell in public and pronounced dead at the scene. All details made public point to this person needing medical attention, yet they were neglected by a system designed to protect private property and corporations, not human life. I eagerly await ACERT's findings in regards to this tragic situation, though I am not confident in that body's ability to hold the police to account. This state of simultaneous surveillance and disregard does not stop at street level. In fact, for some, it starts early in life due to the school resource officer program. I was recently made aware by community activist Simone Polo that the school resource officer for my old high school, St. Joseph's Composite, was once suspended after conducting a callous violation of human rights. Former officer Leal Sutter arrested nine houseless human beings over a period of hours, forced them all into an overcrowded van, and drove them across the city before depositing them into a parking lot. To do what, exactly? To teach what lesson? To serve what purpose other than a cruel and empty power trip? This incident, perhaps not the only occurrence, but rather the only one we know of, bears horrifying resemblance to the Starlight Tours made infamous by colonial police departments across the prairies. After this shameful incident, police administration saw fit to have him reassigned to high schools full of vulnerable teenagers to use tactics like soliciting cigarettes and using bait phones to entrap students. This should raise serious questions, not only in regards to the police service's efficiency with holding its officers to account, but also if it views the SRO program as a punitive measure for its most untrustworthy members. Despite these looming questions, trustees for the public school board voted yesterday to continue this program. Trustee Cheryl Johnner went so far as to assert the program was needed because refugee students, and I quote, only know violence, and that other, see, white students need to feel safe and be protected at school. I know the council was not involved in that discussion, but I hope they share my disgust with this racist and ignorant viewpoint held by a public school trustee. I hope council will do their part to discontinue this harmful program that no one in power seems to know much about, despite the exhaustive efforts of community workers like Bashir Mohammed to raise awareness. To conclude, I would urge the councillors that have spoken about positive interactions with the police to consider that as highly visible and influential public figures, their experience with law enforcement is not at all representative of the whole. A truer picture can be seen in thinly veiled threats from police administrations, warning that their last in first out contracts will spell disaster when funding is inevitably cut. I refer here to Dale McPhee's supposed extremely aggressive hiring of diversity, among other claims to social outreach headed by the police. This strikes me as the service holding these paltry social programs up, as well as the new recruits as a shield to disguise the brutal nature of their institution. No amount of lip service training, regulation, or body cams will fix the fact that policing in this country is built on a rotten colonial foundation. Let me be clear here as well that my preference is not for private security companies or provincially sanctioned volunteer militias to fill the power vacuum. Instead, I invite council to join me in imagining a better world with comprehensive health care, social housing, food security, and fair free transit. A world finally free of police, made possible by responsible use of tax dollars. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you very much. Next is Sophie Pio. Hello. My name is Sophie Pio. I use they, them pronouns, and I live in Tony Caterina's Ward 7. I'm calling for the defunding and abolition of EPS. I hope this is just as moving as a white woman's tears. A few years ago, my friends and I were driving back from volunteering at a queer youth summer camp. 
On 63rd Avenue heading east, we noticed a young child walking in traffic without any shoes on. We pulled over to go to him. He was not verbal and we had no idea what to do. We noticed an EPS vehicle going by and so we waved it down due to the urgency of the situation. Eventually, a woman came running down the street because it was her son. She told us that he often wanders but usually goes the other direction. During this, I noticed that she had a black eye. As the police officer took the child and mother into the car to take them home, I pulled him aside and told him about her black eye and to make sure that she was okay. He looked down at me, smirked, and sarcastically said, sure, and walked away. In that moment, all I could think was, was an indigenous woman's life not even worth pretending to care about? In the end, we made sure they got home safe. We came up with multiple plans to check in depending on what happened, if the cop would arrest anyone, if he took the child into custody, if violence occurred. In that moment, we became community safety. Afterwards, we called one of our aunties to debrief the situation because we were shaken by the whole thing. There was no way to guarantee the safety and well-being of the mother and child. There was nothing else we could offer them, no adequate intervention that existed. But what if we had options to call to actually get people the help they needed, rather than taking the chance on the police who are known to escalate and be violent, especially with Black and Indigenous peoples? I will say this. In the eight years that I lived in Edmonton, I have never seen EPS interact with any marginalized people positively, unless it's for a photo op to look good to the public to justify their existence. This goes especially for how they interact with Black, Indigenous, people of color, and those who are houseless and mentally ill. The vision of EPS as portrayed in their social media, in their photo ops, in their newspaper quotes, is not the EPS that actually exists on the street. I am sure you heard the countless stories during these hearings that have shown that truth. We are seeing protests internationally and on such a large scale because of the level of police brutality and the indisputable video evidence. We have seen it from the horrendous murder of George Floyd to the dash cam video of Chief Alan Adam, Alan, Alan Adam of Athabasca Chippewan First Nation being beaten by the RCMP. There is no denying the vast amount of evidence that is showing police violence all over the world. It would be absolutely ignorant to think that for some reason, Edmonton Police is somehow exempt from this global phenomenon. In fact, we have heard many first-hand accounts and have seen videos which show that EPS is just as capable of violence and racism. Right now, there has been a shift in the world. We are now, see, we are now having these serious discussions about anti-Black racism and whether or not the police are needed, discussions that were widely taboo even a few months ago. We see that the police system isn't broken because it's functioning just as violently as it was intended to. It functions like this even if we have Black, Indigenous, queer, female, etc. officers. We now see the police for what they really are. EPS serves to maintain the status quo. They care more about removing the visibility of houseless people on the street than help them. They react with violence to those who are mentally ill, seeing them as a threat to society rather than those who are deserving of supports. They protect private property over Black and Indigenous lives. They re-traumatize sexual abuse survivors rather than getting them support. And so if they are not serving the most vulnerable people and only exist to maintain the comfort of those in power, what function do they even serve for the public and public safety? What is justice under this system? Lastly, I want to say that it's definitely possible to defund and abolish the police and fund services that actually serve the public good. It is possible because you, Edmonton City Council, are the politicians that have been granted that power. You can go with the wave of change that has come, or you can go try to go against it with useless reforms that never amount to any change, as we have seen time and time again everywhere. And as history has shown, you want to be on the side of the people. I do not want for us to wait until someone in the city dies in order to have change. And to a certain speaker before me, the police protect you because you're white. That is why you feel safe. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tamar Dinner is next. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mayor, Councillors, and my fellow panelists. Uh, my name is Tamar Dinner. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white settler living and working in Treaty 7 territory as a social worker for the time being. I'm speaking today in solidarity with Black Lives Matter Edmonton because I support the motion and implore you to go farther to defund the police and use those funds to create a truly safe city. I have worked in Edmonton and Calgary at nonprofits for over 10 years in early childhood development with child and youth, with folks experiencing homelessness in sexual health and sexual violence prevention. My family immigrated to Edmonton from South Africa in 1989. I was four and a half years old. When we arrived in Canada, apartheid still existed in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was yet to be released. 
after 27 years in prison. I don't remember a time in my life where I did not know what racism was, where I did not know that it was so much more than slurs and hatred. As a child, I understood that it had, um, that it had to be something bigger. It was something so much deeper that it was about power, governments, policies, and laws. I understood that policies, governments, and systems like policing creates racism and allows it to thrive. We are all here now as adults trying to make sense of this world. While some try to deny systemic racism exists here, we know that when we stop being afraid to see the truth, systemic racism is staring us all in the face. We don't have to look any farther than my story. We think of apartheid as something awful, as an undeniable example of systemic racism that happened far away. Well, I have to break it to you. They modeled apartheid off of the Indian Act, their townships off of the reserve system. They copied our past system. And who enforces those systems? Who is central to these racist systems thriving? The police. A lot needs to change. And what I ask of you now is to imagine a different world. I implore you to listen to the voices here who are doing that. Yes, white law enforcement has spoken and white politicians have advocated to maintain the status quo. People like Carrie Diot asking us to get over a murder that happened less than two months ago with already more happening since. You can't get over something that is still happening. You need to change something and stop it from happening. As elected officials, your role is to imagine a better city, a better world. When you hear the words defund, divest, and abolish the police, like many people, you may freeze up. The status quo you know is being challenged. I ask you to not freeze up and shut down, but to start imagining a world where we reallocate police funding towards community action and advocacy that actually makes us safe. A world where mental health services have all the funding they need, where poverty and substance use are not criminalized, where people in uniforms do not have arbitrary power over black and indigenous people, where people without money do not get fined hundreds of dollars for trying to get home on the bus or LRT, where we don't spend money to buy new cars, bikes, and guns for police, but instead we use it to prevent sexual and gender-based violence. As a social worker working in the inner city, I saw the residents enduring ongoing gentrification, being pushed out but not being housed, I saw people constantly being criminalized for being poor, for engaging in sex work, for using substances. The programs exist to support people and more need to be developed, but they don't have the funding. This is inexcusable when police get more money every year. Ibram X. Kendi says, racism is a powerful collection of policies that lead to racial inequity and are substantiated by racist ideas. Anti-racism is a power powerful collection of anti-racist policies that lead to racial equity and are substantiated by anti-racist ideas. Divesting from police and into community is an example of anti-racist policy. Will you choose anti-racism? Dismantling systemic racism is going to take many steps. Voting on this motion to defund the police will make funds available to create safety in our communities for all, not just for some. And most importantly, is a, it is a concrete commitment from council towards anti-racism and dismantling a system that is harming black, indigenous and people of color daily. You have to start somewhere. Start here and start now. Thank you. Thank you. And last speaker on this panel is Irina Langrider. Go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Today I'm speaking as a citizen, a taxpayer, and a mother. What's been happening around the world and in our own city is not only disturbing, but scary. Interestingly enough, over the last few weeks, the conversation shifted from racism and whether it exists in our society to funding cuts and abolishing of police services. I'd like to bring the conversation back to where it started, racism. Unfortunately, it does exist in our society. It's everywhere, and not single race is exempt from it. My personal story is a testament to that. A boy on a school bus ride home told my daughter that she's ugly because of her skin color. You may look at me and say she's white, she grew up entitled and privileged, and that could not be further from the truth. I immigrated to Canada 15 years ago from Russia, and today my children attend a school where they are a minority based on their race, heritage, and skin color. 
My white friends have been called white trash. My police friends have been called pigs. These few examples, however, did not make me lose faith in humanity, nor for me to start painting all people with the same racist brush. You see, the problem of today's society is not racism. It's not lack of diversity. It's fear and inability to address and deal with the problem at hand. I mean, the conversation went from I'm not being treated fairly based on my skin tone to how I can, how I can ride a bus for free, live in a subsidized housing and inject drugs safely. Instead, we must focus on what we should and can do to change the system to ensure transparency and ultimately hold people accountable for their misconduct. Systemic issues call for systemic changes. Now moving on to the topic of funding. Every organization can operate more effectively and efficiently and bring to the table all stakeholders to tackle some of these issues collectively may not only be the efficiency but a viable solution. I did watch Chief McPhee's address followed by Q&A and thought he did an excellent job at articulating the significant work EPS has done in the last 15 months to bridge the gap between then and now. What it boils down to is calls for service are not driven by funding. Take away the funding and it will take longer for police to respond, longer for investigations to be completed. So now go and tell that mother whose child's just been abducted or sexually assaulted that it will take police extra time to locate the child or suspect because the funding's been diverted to program that should have supposedly prevented that incident from happening in the first place. The proposed defund the police action plan and subsequent requests to abolish the police services altogether cannot be described other than irresponsible and dangerous. I mean, if someone breaks into my house with a knife in their hands, I'm not gonna assume that that person is there to help me cut the cake. I'm afraid calling the social worker to calm the situation down is not gonna work either because social workers are not gonna place themselves at risk of being in physical danger. So they will need to call police for their own protection. But who would provide such protection if there's no police? Let's not forget that we live in a democratic society and democracy is a voice of majority. That's why Canadians didn't get rid of our prime minister as a result of the blackface incident. Nor did the citizens of Edmonton dismiss this very council because of the workplace harassment and discrimination allegations that surfaced last year. We've seen numerous examples of producers' criminal sexual behavior, yet we haven't seen TV or movie industry collapse as a result of it. Instead, those individual issues were brought to public light, investigated and acted upon. This is what transparency, democracy and accountability is, and it can only be achieved if we all work together to find solutions. The motion on the floor opened a Pandora's box for various nonprofits who were in support of EPS just a month ago, all of a sudden fighting to get a slice of a financial pie so they can advance their own organizations at the detriment of important police work that is being done every day in our city. This is paradoxical, as their own comments suggest, quote, the deep value and reliance on partnerships with EPS, if I were to quote President of Yes. The REACH organization defines success as, and I quote, dependent on collaboration with government, EPS, and community. The President of African Canadian Civic Engagement Council described work that came out from partnership with EPS as, quote, astonishing. I couldn't state it better than the Executive Director of Elizabeth Fry Society of Edmonton herself, quote, we need long-term sustainable funding. I agree that all these organizations are bringing enormous value to the community and funding gaps must be addressed. However, this is not the avenue that should even have been considered to be taken. Milton Friedman once said, quote, most economic fallacies derive from the tendency to assume that there is a fixed pie that one party can gain only at the expense of another. In other terms, instead of divesting, we need to continue investing in coordinated collaboration. I want to end by saying, the issue of racism and misuse of force should not be turned into a budget exercise. Therefore, I strongly oppose the motion and thank you for your time. Thank you to all of our panelists here this morning. Um, I will just check now with members of council for questions, starting with Councillor McKean. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And I wanted to thank everybody for powerful submissions this morning. Each panel has brought um, slightly different um, perspectives powerfully. Uh, and um, I can only speak for myself, I, but I know my council colleagues and I know that we are all listening and learning and um, want to do what's best for you and for the citizens. So. But I, I wanted to I wanted to hone in on one thing, and I wonder if Jonah Jonah Elke is still with us, uh, because I'm I'm sort of fascinated, um, have long been fascinated with 
restorative justice as an informal way, a community-based way, way to deal with accountability. Don, are you still with us? I am. Thank you. So tell me, you're involved in some restorative justice work in your work? I was. Um, I have since moved on, but um, I was working, doing, um, they are court diversion programs who work with youth who have justice system involvement. Great. Yeah, I was surprised. I think it was last winter. I thought I'd, uh, uh, I'd written about um, restorative just, justice a number of times during my journalism career, and I thought it had fallen off the face of the earth, but there was actually a large um, body uh, of uh, those involved with it at a meeting that I was invited to. So I'm glad to see it's still around. Um, you might not be surprised to hear that there was a research and investigative uh, piece done years ago that showed that youth crime wasn't really up, but what had happened was society demanded more formal dealings with uh, kids, youth, that had done something wrong. In the past, the school principal might have required the kid to um, spend his lunch hours cleaning the graffiti off the school, and nowadays, uh, what started to happen is they'd get charged. And um, that may be, so do you see restorative justice, community-led restorative justice, as one of the uh, ways that we can shift away from, from criminal justice, law and order responses? I think it's important to acknowledge that restorative and transformative justice, which is another branch of community-based justice that is currently being used, are primarily used by communities that don't have access to the police. So when right. we think about these problems, people are like, oh, well, why don't these communities just call the police? But when you're undocumented or um, the police have never respected you, or I know a young person who called the police because they were in distress and the police arrested their aunt because she looked like another indigenous woman who they had a warrant out for, right? So in community, these restorative and transformative justice programs are really useful because it involves a collaboration between the community that surrounds the people who have been harmed and the people who have done the harm. The problem with sort of having police involved in this is that police aren't really members of the communities where this harm is occurring. And so at the end of the day, having a, kind of a police presence around these structures will sort of render them useless because it encourages people to not take accountability, which is the point of these restorative justice procedures to begin with. These exists, sorry, so people um, can feel safe and they know that they won't be excommunicated if they've done something wrong. Yeah. Because, I, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to, sorry, I was going to say, I, I saw the healing occur in some pretty major crime incidents, actually, in one involving a, uh, actually a homicide, and there was healing in the restorative justice practice. Whereas the argument was if you go through the formal criminal justice procedure, uh, there is far less healing. And there's detachment from, from accountability in some ways too. And restorative justice is hard justice. It is hard. And I'm a big fan of it. And um, my commitment is to try to bring um, maybe a, uh, an amendment to the main motion to get some further investigation of that and how we could encourage that in Edmonton to replace um, some of the work we're doing that I think, I think uh, criminalization of poverty and mental illness and addiction, it, we, could, we could do better with especially the vulnerable people, people of color and, and, and black people and indigenous people. Or, or, included in that because their our systems um, our systems are failing a lot of people and I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. Um, I'm sorry, can I um, point out one thing that I think is really crucial? It's okay if it's a no. No, go ahead. Um, so right now we're having a problem in youth restorative justice where the court, because the court is increasingly conservative right now, is not diverting youth to our programs anymore. So programs who do restorative justice with youth aren't getting the referrals that they used to get under not least government because the courts are shifting 
more conservative. And I worry that it, in a system where police are in charge of deciding which cases go to community diversion and which, which cases go to the court and through the formal justice system, what will happen is the police just won't divert people because they'll see especially racialized people as being dangerous enough for chronic, um, chronically criminal or whatever language they use. I don't listen to them that much. So, um, but those people will get sent to the justice system to be dealt with because they are serious offenders um, rather than people who are just struggling and have had lives that are really difficult. I hope the people who present to us during these panels are also presenting to the Premier's office, the Justice Minister's office, and the Solicitor General's office. Thank you very much, Joan, and thanks to everyone. Thank you. Uh, I have so far Councillor Paquette, Councillor Banga, and Councillor Henderson. Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to all the panelists. I wish I could ask you all questions, but we're limited to one round of five minutes each. Um, so perhaps I'll go to uh, tomorrow dinner, since you've experienced, uh, or at least uh, grew up in awareness of, uh, of two systems. Um, my question is a little bit difficult, but I'd like to get your take and your perspective on the idea that people who benefit from the current system can hear all of these stories of, uh, of pain, of inequality, and, uh, and being marginalized. And they can hear the history of how this all came to be but it doesn't land and it doesn't inform their perspective in a meaningful way. So I'm just wondering if you could expand on that. Um, thank you, Aaron. If I had the answer for that, I think we um, live in a very different world. Um, why is it that some people can hear the pain and the harm caused to others by um, systemic inequity and racism and want to change that and do something about it and see the through line? and that other people can't. And I think um, if I can talk about um, Ibram X. Kendi again, um, he has an analogy that says white supremacy is just raining on us all the time. It's like the rain that surrounds us falling on us and we're all wet. And for some of us, we can recognize that we're wet and that we need to do something about it. But one of the things that white supremacy does is that for so many people, they just deny that they're even wet. They say, no, this isn't happening. I'm not even wet when we are. And what we need to do is, um, and he talks about that we need to just ask, can I have an umbrella? How can I help in this situation? How can I stop this from happening? How can I see what's happening and listen to you and understand? And I think um, part of what happens is that some people can't even see what's happening. During apartheid, which we can look back to and without a doubt say that that was something wrong that was happening, um, we can look at that and see that. Canada has the only remaining racist policy. The Indian Act is the only named policy that talks about um, people based on their race. So apartheid ended. <laughs> Our system has not ended in Canada. And so I think that it is very hard to see things while they were happening, just like white people didn't see what was happening during apartheid it is very hard for people right now to see that this is happening. And um, I think that's a really good question is how can we get people, um, like Natasha said, find people you can talk to about racism, about whiteness, about your white fragility, um, so that we can move forward and that we can get more people to see that, um, to see that change needs to happen. Thank you. And just to follow up, um a lot of people feel that the system as it is should be protecting the majority because the majority of folks, in, for example, in Edmonton, tend to be of uh, particular demographics and benefits them, benefits them. And so why can't everyone else just pick themselves up and transform their lives in order to become more like that and fit into those demographics? And then they too would be protected. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think that's kind of 
this assimilation way of thinking that if people could just be like white people, if people could just be this model demographic, model model minority, which um, I think is... Oh. I'm, also, I'm, I'm not speaking of a particular race, but just like financial demographics play into this. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's really important to say because speaking to the people who are talking about crime and crime going up and crime's not going away, we know that the crime exists because people live in poverty. People are unemployed. If we reduce poverty, if we get, if people have housing, if people are employed, um, crime goes down. And so I think that this idea that people can pick themselves up by the bootstraps, um, I mean, it's just been unfounded in so many ways and evidence has shown that that is just not the case. Like you can read <laughs> the works of many professors to talk about that is just not the case we need to create more equity in society which does not mean everyone having the same um that's equality which doesn't exist in our society we need equity um which is what you're talking about Aaron. that we can't just put everyone into one mold and expect it to come out the same it doesn't work that way great thank you very much i'm out of time thank you next is councillor manga Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, I'm going to go straight to my questions uh, for Miss. Is it Landgrader? And uh, speaker number sixteen. Um, Miss Landgrader, I uh, from your own, I guess, statement, you said the racism does exist, and uh, you have. Uh, you know people should be hold, uh, held accountable for. And uh, my question to you is, this motion you said uh, does not address. Are you, this motion is basically first analyzing, uh, seeking information and providing transparency. I think that's what we all agree. So why would you be not in favor of uh, this motion, at least most of the motion, rather than uh, uh, rejecting it altogether, just uh, going with the status quo. Um, thank you for your question. I think um, I think the motion needed to be uh, broken into two. One that would focus in addressing the um, the issue of racism and misuse of force, which 100% is an issue. Um, and, um, you know, just like, you know, if, if we're looking at other professions, teachers, doctors, accountants, we want to make sure that we hold everybody accountable um, for their behavior, whether it's racist behavior or any other behavior. Um, the motion, although right now on the floor is focusing on budgeting. Uh, whether we need to take the money out and repurpose it um, to um, to social agencies. Um, I liked how what, what Lindsay said in her speech is um, a lot of the people on the panel have the privilege of n not knowing how much crime there is in the city of Edmonton. And drug dealers and pedophiles are not going to magically disappear uh, because you're going to defund the police. They'll still be there. They'll still be abusing um, uh, the system and our children and our peers, regardless of um, whether you're going to take that 30% or defund the police. The bad folks are still going to be there and we'll need police to, um, to, look, after, to look after us as a, um, as a nation. Anyway, the motion could be split uh, later on. It's just a motion for now. Uh, question for Ms. Harder. Uh, Ms. Harder, you uh, mentioned in your presentation that uh, uh, police re-traumatizes uh, victims. Is it the police or is it also our justice system? Everything all combined together. Yeah, absolutely. It's 100% the entire justice system, the whole, the whole process, anything related to law enforcement, it's all 
Um, it's already traumatizing. You're absolutely right. Um, and that's exactly why, as Jonah was saying, like we need to invest and utilize um, systems um, surrounding community accountability. I think um, they're much safer systems for like victims of, of sexual abuse to to go to. There's less risk of that re-traumatization for sure. Okay, um, so when uh, right now uh, uh, defunding of police is the main topic, whether it's going to happen or not, will uh, it will be debated? But could you tell me that once uh, there is uh, no police, would we have any justice system at all? Like, what's the need for that? Um. Yeah, I think like going back to remarks that have already been made, there are systems that black people, indigenous people, and people of color have been utilizing for community accountability for literally hundreds of years because they cannot turn to, to police. And, and, you know, even a lot of white people feel that they can't turn to police as well. Um, so I guess maybe my answer is like we already have those systems, we need to be investing in those systems. There is literally no reason to have police when all they do is traumatize people because police commit sexual violence as well and re-traumatize people who have already been through sexual violence. So um, um, then you mentioned 40% uh, of uh, police commit spousal violence, sexual violence, whatever. Uh, could you be able to share with me or send me something where I can get this uh, these stats? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I will email you today. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Next is Councillor Henderson. Uh, yeah, Mr. Elka, I there's was something interesting that you said, uh, and I and I I asked for Councillor McKean's um, enthusiasm for restorative justice. I actually I didn't never did any of it myself, but was part of an organization that did mediation and restorative justice. That uh, so I'm I'm well aware of it. What's interesting to me about what you're putting forward, and it's one of the one of the essential questions I'm wondering we need to ask better is this line between what the police do and what the justice part of the system does, which is making decisions about the meeting out of justice or whatever that looks like, feels like it's got really muddied over time. And that that's part of the problem that I don't think that has ever, you know, that the meeting out of justice has ever been part of what we ask the police to do. And yet that feels like that has become part of the way going forward. And that's one of the really fundamental questions I want to ask about. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, because I'm not sure I, it troubles me a little bit that it becomes the police's call on how justice is meted out. I mean, when we allow police to kill people and not be accountable to that, we are suggesting that they have the final call on who is executed, right? Um, you can leave violent people in a room by themselves and there's not that much harm they can actually cause at that moment. That's how my partner de-escalates students when they have weapons and are trying to stab her. We don't need to shoot people. Um, I would love it. No, I wouldn't. Um, I, it would be, it's a little naive to think that cops are giving out, um, you know, charges based on sort of a really fair and everyone gets judged the same way system, but that's not the way it works. White people get um, warnings. They get paths, you know, they get, don't do that next time. They get right where people of color are dying so, or they get a knee on their neck when they make a distress call or so I think it's yeah I think it's naive to expect that police aren't involved in the justice system in that way they do decide who gets brought into the justice system that's that is their job um and they probably have a little bit too much power in that regard a little is maybe an understatement on my part yeah yeah, well, it strikes me that, you know, there is a decision that we do ask them to do, but the meeting out of justice is not one of them, I don't think. Um, you know, and the, and the uh, you know, the, I, you know, we look at a number of the instances we've seen recently that seem punitive. Um, and, the, and it worries me that we put that expectation on and that has become acceptable in a way that I think is 
what's muddying things in terms of what we actually want and expect and empower the police to do right now. I mean, understanding, I think what you're saying as well, if I've got it right, is that, you know, there are other questions about that other part of the system, the justice part of the system that we also need to be asking that are also part of it. But I just, I just wanted to explore it with you because I actually worry that we put them together and that it probably is really important that they're two separate things. It's our system, it's part of the protection in our system that they were set up to be separate. And I'm, from what I'm hearing you saying, is confirming that they have got muddied over time. Is that fair to say? Uh, I think that is fair. I think um, this police conversation is the first conversation in a long, long series of conversations where we talk about how our justice system is colonial and it's enforcing essentially British law upon lands that were stolen from indigenous people here. Um, I had one more thing to say about that, police. Oh yeah, um, I think anytime you give people power, like we have given police, they will abuse it. They that's, they have a hard job and it's, it's hard not to turn that into anger towards the people that you're supposed to be serving. They have too much power. It's impossible. Great. Thank you very much. That was essentially my question. I'm virtually out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for taking your time to come and uh, share with us today your perspectives. Um, I do have a question for Christy Harcourt. Um, you had mentioned that uh, you work with an organization um, that works to keep uh, your clients safe. You talked about how you chose not to have the police at an event, uh, the Clear Youth, um, and you found other ways to keep them safe. Um, I find that fascinating. Um, so do you think we need to fund more organizations and or train them? Because I don't think everyone's doing what you're doing. Thank you, Ms. Esslinger. Um, I think that the communities, and a few other speakers have said this, Alexis in particular, communities know themselves. They know their strengths and they know their vulnerabilities. And I think that there are lots of communities that if they had um, a little less financial pressure, they could be more creative. They could imagine their own safety. Um, and so, yeah, so for our event, our biggest safety concern is that homophobic and transphobic people will target our event. Um, honestly, that's our big concern. Um, so we keep, and our, we hold our event at Central Lions here in, I think it's in Ward 2 also. Um, so, so we really plan because we know that uniform police will, will escalate some of the young people who come to our event. We know that they will then be um, more at risk, those young people. So, so we've really been uh, very deliberate in that way. I really think that a lot of communities could do this work as well, that they could um, think about what safety means, think about where unsafety exists in their neighborhoods and think about community-based approaches I don't think that's about militias or uh, sort of um, some of the things that we're hearing provincially, but I think it's about knowing each other, knowing our neighbors, and being able to um, find other ways of dealing with, with issues as they come up. No, and I appreciate that. I just wasn't sure they have to do so, or maybe they need to be encouraged to do so. Um, because it seems like a natural thing for communities to want to support their own. So that, that's the, where I was concerned about that. So for you, you talked about it partly funding, partly about encouragement um, to do so. Is that correct then? I don't think that it's about so much about encouragement. I think it's about, res I think it's a lot about resourcing and people knowing that they're allowed to, that they're allowed to take leadership over their own environments that they're allowed to take ownership. Uh, you know, our community leagues have beautiful structures to do soccer. Um, my community league today is mowing the lawn. They're mowing the park. People just decided because there was a little space that was created and they decided to find a way to mow the park. Mm -hmm. um, so when, if, we, if we have more opportunities to call on each other, and maybe the city could be a catalyst for those conversations to come together to think, 
Uh, as you know, Ms. Aslinger, here in our Ward 2, we have a beautiful, dynamic Ethiopian community. Um, I get to be right at the heart of it here. And um, I wonder in that community what knowledge there might be about how to look after the young people, about how to help them to keep occupied, about how to organize families and, and family supports. So I think that sometimes when there's a little bit of a vacuum, we fill it and we fill it with our own creativity and our own innovation. And I appreciate that you talked about community leagues and I, I think there's lots of groups that could be engaged in this conversation. So I, I think that conversation with the cross section of communities would be important. Thank you very much for sharing today. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And again, thank you to all of the, this panel for providing your comments. Uh, Ms. Harcourt, I, I wanted to ask because you had briefly touched on it during your presentation. Uh, did you, did I hear you correctly saying you were actually involved in the street check review work? Is that correct? Oh, did we lose? Oh, I see Christy's rejoining. Uh, is Christy back? Ms. Harcourt. Ms. Ms. Harcourt, Harcourt are you there? Uh, you're just muted right now, Ms. Harcourt, uh, but, but I have a question for you if you're able to unmute. Thank you. Sorry, I, I am uh, sorry. I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> that's okay. We've so I don't there. know if you heard my question. I'll give you some time. Okay. So you had mentioned that uh, I think you were involved with the street check review, the actual report process. Is that correct? It was, yes. Okay. Um, you touched on it very briefly, so I wouldn't mind maybe a little more information if you would, if you wouldn't mind expanding. It sounded like, um, you know, the, all this work went into the report, and it. I, I feel like I'm interpreting what you said as is pretty much pushed off to the side. But can you elaborate? Because I don't want to put words in your mouth on that. I'd be happy to. At the time that the street check report occur, uh, research happened, I was working for the Pride Center of Edmonton as a program manager. I don't work there anymore, and I don't represent them. Um, the researchers could not get anybody in the LGBTQ community to talk to them, is the truth. Um, because I think the relationships with the police were so broken down. So they called me like five times and asked me to take part. I'm a 47-year-old white lady who lives in a middle class who owns her house. I don't, I don't get carded. Um, so my funder, so the researchers called my funder and told them to make me take part. And so I did. That's how it works when you work in a nonprofit. And I convened a focus group. I am referred to as the old gay lady, uh, old gay white lady in the research. That's me. I convened a focus group at great social capital, honestly, asking colleagues who were racialized and had an experience of carding if they would share their experience. And they did. They were misgendered in the report. Um, and they told their stories about being carded. One of them talked about not being able to leave their neighborhood because of being carded. Another one talked about how the pressures of youth homelessness and family violence were complicated by the fact that when they couldn't go home, they would get harassed and moved along by police. Um, so we did take part in that research, not with a lot of hope, honestly, but with under some pressure. And uh, so I was there the day that the report was launched at the police commission. I was invited and I went. Um, and then, and I read the report, I had some frustrations with it, but I did feel like, okay, here's the information about carding. And that day, I don't know how they read it so fast, but that day the then chief dismissed the report. He said that it revealed that there was no problem and that it, uh, that it upheld the position of the EPS. And it was so frustrating for me. I'm sure it was frustrating for many of you on council, um, to hear, to have like, tried again to engage with the system and to have them just dismiss it. Um, so carding is an issue. Carding is an issue that deeply impacts trans people, gender non-conforming people, indigenous people, black people, and many others in Edmonton. Um, and uh, if the pol if, I know you can't make the police stop carding. I know that that's beyond your ability. The only things I understand that you can control about the police is their budget and their buildings. And so I'm asking you to impact their budget uh, as a way of trying to make these things be taken more seriously. I'm sorry that I hung up before. 
No, no, no. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, I, I think I have enough time for one more question for Mr. Elke, I believe it was, uh, and just wanted to confirm. So you talked about situations where your partner is de-escalating students, including violent situations. We've heard a lot during the public hearing uh, from people who say that police are going to be needed in some of those situations. You know, we're never going to eliminate that, that need in its entirety. I actually want to ask sort of if we took a step back and we looked at what we would need to do further upstream to try, do you have any suggestions or if your partner had any suggestions around what we would need to do upstream to help remove the need from even your partner having to be de-escalating a situation like that? Are there things that we should be investing in or doing to help reduce the that sort of emergency call? When my partner is interacting with these students, these students are often having a mental health crisis. They are uh, people who have experienced a lot of trauma in their lives um, via the residential school system, just uh, like school being um, dangerous for them, uh, teachers not taking them seriously, repeatedly getting kicked out of classrooms. These are kids who have often gone to 30 schools by the time they're in high school. They're kids who, in general aren't going to graduate high school because their behavior is such that they won't they can't stay in school so these situations are situations that happen to especially traumatized people when you get triggered it's really hard your body goes into fight mode and you will fight people it doesn't mean that you're a bad person it doesn't mean that you're dangerous at any other time in your life you are triggered you're having a mental health episode when white people especially talk about violent crime we often talk like Violent crime is happening because there are evil people in the world who are coming to get you. But that, in general, isn't really what's happening when people are violent. There's inter, um, interpersonal disputes. There's, you know, that's most of it, actually, right? People don't, we know from statistics that people don't kill strangers very often. That's not really something that happens. So I don't think that there's anything that we can do at the end of the day besides not traumatizing people anymore, which isn't going to happen, um, to really, to keep escalation from happening. I think what ultimately needs to be happening is that pol if police are still involved in these calls, we need to be seeing the person in front of them with dignity and humanity and empathy. And right now, with the way the police system works, that isn't possible. Police officers aren't going into calls expecting to find another human being there who's in distress and offering care to that person. They are escalating the situation most of the time. Body cams don't help. We've tried trainings, right? What has, Minneapolis was a progressive police um, service and they had to disband because they realized that what they were doing wasn't working. Um, and I think that that holds true here. Thank you, I'm, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hold on just a second here. Any other questions from members of council? Councilor Piquet, could you take the chair? I have the chair. Great, thank you. Uh, so, um, Ms. Uh, uh, Frizik, thank you. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. But I, uh, I think I agree with your point that having a fear-based conversation about any of this is, is problematic. Um, and in fact, I think fear of the other uh, or other groups that are othered um, is at the root of so much of the pain that we're hearing about here. And that to the extent we can have a conversation rooted in love and compassion and curiosity and openness to the experiences of other people, um, that, that we're going to get further. Uh, so, so uh, first of all, I guess I want to check, are we aligned on the values there as a starting point? I mean, uh, thanks for your question. <laughs> um, Sure, like approaching, centering yourself in love is great. Centering yourself as a white person in the conversation is deeply problematic. Um, however, when I mention white fragility, uh, and from, <laughs> I mean, that is a tool of white supremacy. Uh, white fragility wants us to be afraid. Um, white supremacy wants us to enforce it, you know, so that every choice I make in my day uh, that feels good to me is actually, and I don't even know it, it's doing a violence 
to somebody else. Um, and uh, so I think, yeah, just be rooted in love, be rooted in compassion, also be rooted in historical fact and do a lot of research. Um, I would defer to anybody else who has any idea. <laughs> well, I, I, there are lots of different models of, of understanding racism out there. Usually the different models I've seen make it some kind of distinction between uh, historical and structural and systemic and institutionalized racism and interpersonally mediated or, or personal or individual racism. And I think one of the things that happens in these conversations of what I've observed and, and what I would like your reaction and reflection on is that an aspect of the fragility that you describe uh, is, and, and I think um, Ms. Dinner mentioned this and I'd like her thoughts too in a moment, but that people can hear the conversation about structural and institutional or systemic racism and internalize that defensively. That that is the, the active fragility of, of taking personally the commentary about what is systemic. And the minute someone is there, and I have been there, I'm not there right now, but I have been there when, you, when a person feels that they're being personally attacked for their role in upholding a system. And I am the mayor, so I am not at the center of that, but I am a focal point of it, along with other leaders in the community. That that, that is a challenging place to have a open and curious and loving and compassionate conversation uh, that, that really hears um, uh, the pain and the concerns and the policy suggestions. So I want to acknowledge that that is, that is very real. Uh, what you've described, um, and then and then ask for your reaction and and uh, Miss uh, Dinner's reaction about what are the best antidotes to that that you have seen that open up um, the most thoughtful kind of space for actually tackling the both well for people to go through the kind of reflection that I think we're all being asked to do right now around our own individual uh, experience and our individual privilege and benefit from systems that have advantaged uh, white people and men in particular. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay, well, how do we um, get back, you know, how do we get who's back to the structural and institutional? Go ahead, please. Yeah, someone who's helped me a lot in this understanding is named Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, she's a writer and a poet and, um, and, you know, she's really calling, like, she will speak very clearly to white people and say, like, don't personalize it. Like, if you think of uh, whiteness as something, like a sickness that's like, like Tamar mentioned, the raining down on all of us. Um, as soon as you personalize that, as soon as you don't even want to have a conversation about race because it makes you feel guilty, um, you've shut down and you're not open to ideas and you're not listening. And um, then you're making it about you. <laughs> and that's not what needs to be happening right now. Um, and, and you know you got to move fast on this because like, like time is taken. Like how long does it take to deal with this shit? Well, please mind Pardon your, my French. your language I'm so sorry. In, in, in this setting. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear Miss uh, uh, Diner on the same point before I run out of time. Thanks Don. Um, I think what's most important, um, I mean, there are many uh, people of color on this panel who could speak to this so much better than I can, and so many Black and Indigenous people talking about what we white people can do and telling us over and over and over again. So I don't want to take up too much space as a white person talking about that. Um, there are people in our own city who are, are telling us what we can do. We need to listen and we need to learn. And we, like Natasha said, we need to make this 
um, um, not something we have to do our personal work but we also have to realize that this is about the bigger picture, um, not be defensive and not make our own feelings. Um, our feelings do not matter more than black and indigenous people's lives and everyday experiences. Um, so keep digging into that. And I think one of the most important things we can do is sit in discomfort, right? People are not used to being uncomfortable because of racism. People who experience racism are uncomfortable every day. And if after two weeks we've had enough with talking about racism and anti-racism, that is not okay. This is something we need to sit with discomfort in every single day um, until, um, until Black and Indigenous and people of color can live their lives with dignity, um, with being given dignity and respect with others. They're living their lives with dignity and integrity, um, but we also need to find our own humanity to be able to do that as well. Well, thank you. I wish I could get perspectives from many of you on it, but you've, many of you have addressed it in your points. So uh, thank you all for, for your contributions to the civil discourse here this morning. Um, well, I suppose technically I'll take the chair back from Councillor Paquette. Thank you. Um, and so with, uh, with thanks for all of you and uh, for the tip on Sonia Renee Taylor, uh, Eula Bliss has been really helpful to me uh, uh, in this uh, for what it's worth uh, as, a, as another resource on, on some of these questions. Um, so um, uh, unless I'll just one last call to see if there are any other questions from members of council here. Not seeing any, then uh, we will recess until panel 11, which is scheduled to begin at uh, 1.30 p.m. Thank you all.
Alrighty, I think we're online. So I will uh, start roll call to establish attendance of members of council at this virtual meeting, uh, starting this time with Councillor Walters. I am here, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon. <coughs> Councillor Banga. Present. Welcome. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Katarina. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Zadek. Present. Thank you. Councillor Essinger. I'm here. Welcome. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Welcome. Councillor Henderson. I am here. Thank you. Councillor McKean. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Oop, and I skipped Councillor Knack by accident there. So it's all good, Captain. Good alphabetically afternoon. Alphabetically here. Thank you. Councillor Nickel. And Councillor Paquette. Oop, got to unmute yourself, sir. Good afternoon. There we go. Okay. Uh, so that's full attendance, which is great. I will now um, explain uh, the process for uh, today's public hearing on the referred motion regarding the Edmonton Police Commission. And uh, um, just uh, for your orientation, speakers have been paneled and will present to council in the order in which they registered with the city clerks. Each speaker will have uh, five minutes to speak. The clerk will run a timer here in the room, but you may wish to have your own timer to pace yourself accordingly. Once you've finished speaking though, please mute your microphone, but do stay on the line as council may wish to ask you questions after all of the other speakers on the panel have made their presentations. Each councillor will be given up to five minutes to ask one round of questions, if they so wish. Uh, after each panel, we will hold a recess um, to allow us to set up for the following panel of presenters. However, if you wish to continue to listen and follow along in the meeting after your panel is complete, please use the live stream which is available on edmonton.ca slash meetings as always. This process does require a little bit of patience from everyone to ensure that the virtual meeting um, enables everyone to address council um, and, and have a, a full opportunity to participate. Uh, so. Please refrain, though, uh, I must ask, from using the chat function during the meeting as it can create issues of decorum, it can provide unfair advantage uh, and be disruptive to those who are speaking, and uh, it can also glitch up the live stream. So uh, please also remember, as a matter of courtesy, to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. If any of you are experiencing any technical challenges, the Office of the City Clerk has additional resources available to help facilitate your participation in the meeting. Please reach out to them using the contact information provided in the reply to your registration. A speaker's list for each panel will be provided on edmonton.ca slash meetings for your reference. So now I will roll call the panelists. Please uh, uh, make note of the order in which you are on the panel here so that you can be ready when it's your turn. Uh, first up will be Kathleen Inman. Hello, Kathleen. <laughs> Kathleen, are you there? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can now. Thank you very much. Next is Megan Yu. Hello. Hello and welcome. Next Thank is you so much. Martin Luther Mukibi. Yes, I'm present. Welcome. Next is Bronwyn Tucker. Yep, present. Welcome. Next is Ezra Hockett. Uh, present. Welcome. Next is Georgia Englot. I'm present. Welcome. Next is Kira Coster. Present. Welcome. Next is Aliyah Rauf. Present. Welcome. Next is Drayden Favell. They did not check in with us. Okay. Uh, next then is Helen Frost. Present. Welcome, and last on this panel will be Heather Macklem. Hello. Welcome. Thank you all for um, making yourselves virtually available here. So we will start now with Kathleen Inman. The floor is yours for the next five minutes. Welcome. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Please proceed. Oh, one. thank you. Uh, so hello, my name is Kathleen. I am from Ward 9. 
I am here in support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, black and Indian people are disproportionately represented in the prison system and often face harassment and infringements of their rights due to the internalized and systemic racism that is present, I believe, within EPS. And uh, this is very much a concern to me. However, to some, it's, it's life-threatening. So I urge you to immediately repeal the $75 million budget increase and read it into things that are a little more practical, like affordable housing, um, mental health programming, um, community-led organizations would be great, and the 211. As well, I urge you to immediately redirect about 30% of the police budget, as the chief mentioned, and redirect it towards um, professionals who are trained in handling end of crisis uh, that's related to like uh, mental health, substance abuse, um, family matters, uh, children, as well, healthcare, homeless, those kinds of things. As well, uh, I would like to say something about schools and their uh, school resource officer program. Uh, and right now I am quite appalled that there's absolutely no oversight of this program uh, for the public, which can probably has led to an extreme abuse of power. Um, as well, the program is quite costly to the public school system, and I believe that that money, again, can be used for things such as uh, social workers, psychologists, uh, public health nurses, and so on. And that, for right now, is all I'd like to touch on, as I am still learning. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Miss Yu. Go ahead. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I appreciate the time and effort each of you is putting in right now to listen to the concerns of your communities. Uh, it's my hope that you truly hear the truths that Black and Indigenous people across this continent are speaking when they say that policing is a threat to their lives and their communities. My name is Megan, as you know, and I have worked and studied in Edmonton for the past 12 years. As a mixed race white passing person, I, do not have, I have not experienced the racism that our systems enact on Black and Indigenous people every day. However, I have witnessed its deep entrenchment in our systems and its impact on the lives of Edmontonians. As an education student, I was angered by the overwhelming whiteness of the field, the erasure of so much of the richness of our communities. While classrooms were sites of a diversity of cultures, experiences, and wisdom, so few of these students had a teacher who shared their experiences, who they could see themselves reflected in. In my practicum, I worked at a Cree school in the Catholic school division. While the students I spent time with there shared great wisdom, love, talent, and resilience with me, I saw the impacts of racism and intergenerational trauma in the classroom every day. Students who lived in poverty, who experienced trauma, who lived in the child welfare system, in a classroom that required so much support given the challenges a traditional classroom holds for so many students. Due to funding, we only had one part-time assistant. In my two months at that school, three students in my classroom lost close family members, and two students in the school had siblings who went missing. Missing and murdered Indigenous women is not an unfortunate news item for these students. It is their reality. In this school, a school resource officer, or SRO, as Kathleen had mentioned, was dispatched to purportedly build relationships with students and their families. I can only imagine they felt such a need because of the great traumas enacted by police on Indigenous communities engender a mistrust, even at such an early age. What good does this funding do for this community when there is no justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women? What good does building trust do when the violence experienced by Indigenous communities and Black communities at the hands of police does not change? Does this not create a false sense of trust for children uh, that is in fact endangering when they come to call upon the police? In a presentation made by EPS to the Police Commission, made available in Bashir Mohammed's Edmonton Anti-Racism, uh, sorry, Anti-Black Racism Toolkit, it was revealed that bait phone programs were implemented by SROs in schools. In instance, a cell phone would be placed in the school as bait, and if a student were to take it, the SRO, and I quote, would apprehend the suspect. This program was used as a way to deter crime. 
Does this not seem like a prime example of the school to prison pipeline? How can you justify this as an ethical use of public money? Of course, SROs are only a manifestation of the problematic nature of policing. EPS's use of carding targets black and indigenous community members. This is systemic racism. Not to mention the failure of policing to address urgent and systemic mental health and sexual violence issues. In these past two months, we have been thrown into a way of operating that has forced us to change almost every aspect of how we live our lives. It has shown us that the systems and institutions that we too often view as unchangeable, immovable, almost sacred, can be rendered useless in their modes of operation as they exist. How we can quickly adapt our systems to serve our immediate needs. This moment is our opportunity, your opportunity, to create a safer, more just world for all Edmontonians. I know many people cannot envision what defending the police could look like. Who would protect us? I would like to remind you that for vast numbers of the communities that you represent, the police is not a body of protection, but a violent threat. Who do you call when the police commit the crime? These demands that we are hearing from all over the world are not political whims of the moment, but hundreds of years of racist oppression coming to a head. As our representatives, you have the opportunity to choose a new path, to make real and impactful change for your communities. Edmontonians deserve better, and they deserve it now. This is something that we will hold you as our representatives accountable to. Thank you so much for your consideration and your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Martin Luther Mukibi. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about um, this topic. My name, my name is Martin Luther Mukibi. I've been living this day for the past 12 years. And I just want to give some uh, highlights of what I think should be done about the scope of work for the police. I'm just thinking that if there is a way whereby the police could be able to stick to their scope of work, whereby they just focus on aspect to do with keeping law and order, and then other institutions can be able to do other things which they're supposed to do, like um, aspect to do with social services, could be offered with other institutions. And then um, the aspect of to do with homelessness, there are like over 16,000 people, house people who are, like, don't have a home where to stay. And the city currently is focusing on aspect to do with uh, infrastructure development. But at the end of the day, most of these people, like the homeless, is this, it's because of poverty, whereby the poverty levels are so high, that's why they end up in two, in two contact with the police. My suggestion would be that if the city would set up like a um, housing up for the affordability fund, which uh, would be able to utilize to build some simple, some houses for the people, because at the end of the day, if people are poor, it becomes unsafe for all this institution, all this infrastructure which you are building downtown, like the rec centers and all that, because some other people can't use them, and then it affects the local economy. So I'm trying to look at it from the economic perspective, whereby if the city will be able to allocate some funds, whereby those funds will be directed to work in partnership with other funding institutions like banks or like something like Habitat International, whereby these people will be able to have a decent home because I believe all these aspects which are trying to generate about racism and all that, it originates from the aspect of poverty. If we can go to break the chain of poverty within the city, whereby at least 10% of the people who don't have a home can be able to find a decent place where to stay, we can be able to really do away with all this aspect of uh, homelessness. And then uh, this other aspect of street patrolling by the police, whereby they just target people like me who are the minorities, all these things can be handled. And then we can be able to look at the other aspect of re-engineering the police, whereby we don't start to stop looking at it from the traditional institutional structure, whereby we can be able to think what should be the role of the police in the 21st century. How can we be able to motivate the police to work with the community to be able to find makeable solutions for all the problems which come up from the community? And then the other aspect which I thought we would look at is um, how can we be able to see the members of the, the leaders like to support the community, like, for instance, like the whole like aspect to do with um, people who have mental health and all that. 
why can they just be why can the people who have expertise be able to address that instead of the police working at that because i find that would be extremely ex costly to the taxpayer who is paying all that so my advice to you is for the councillors and the respective leaders to be able to re-examine and see how far we can be able to put the three aspects of good governance, transparency and accountability with a new transformation of the police instead of just operating in the same structure which is traditional, which doesn't serve the interest of the city, which doesn't have the interest of all the stakeholders. So I would ask the mayor to look at this aspect, not aspect to do aspect of racism, but also to look at the aspect of local economy, because at the end of the day, if you build all this wonderful infrastructure, but people don't feel safe to come downtown and enjoy the services which you're setting up, that means you're leaving some other people behind. I would ask the mayor if he'd be able to come up with programs whereby you can be able to build like a master program, a master plan, or for five or 10 years, and look for some funds which can be able to direct to housing. Because without housing, it's hard for to survive. That's why they end up on the street. They end up being idle because they don't have anywhere to plan. They can't just lie on the, having the internet at the libraries or sitting in Tim Hortons. That's not decent enough. You should look at your people and understand if these were your family members every day being pursued by the police, how would you feel? If these were your kids every day being monitored at school, how would you feel? How would you go home and then just ask yourself and say that they are safe, everything is okay? I think it's within your limits of power to ask and see, do the right thing for the community. Defining is not the solution. The solution is for all stakeholders to sit together and find what is suitable for the people and for the good of the city. Thank you, and I yield my time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, next is Bronwyn Tucker. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Bronwyn. I'm a community member uh, here to speak in support of the motion. Um, please pass it. Um, and more importantly, please go further. I think it, it kind of fairly begins to address the, the anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, and other systemic inequalities um, being perpetrated by the massive police budget um, that so many others um, in the past two weeks have, have already spoken to um, at, at great length. Um, I think yeah, in, in terms of the outcomes of this motion, uh, specifically, there, there's no explicit action um, promised. And I think that it's, it's very clear that action is, is needed. Um, so like many others, um, I am calling for an immediate budget cut of 30% of the police budget, an immediate repeal of uh, the 75 million uh, budget increase that, that has been planned. Um, I think in addition, um, seeing so much of the police budget go to um, fair enforcement on, on transit, um, which is, has, um, as has been documented, um, really disproportionate impacts on, on low-income communities, on racialized communities, um, and um, frankly is, is just a huge expense that um, could be better put elsewhere. Um, and similarly, I think that SROs in schools um, also have um, a specifically egregious impact that should be addressed as soon as possible. And beyond that, um, it would, yeah, really hope to see a roadmap for allocating resources to community-based models of safety, support, and prevention um, to build a city without police. Um, I think some of the, the research from, from Progress Alberta and Bashir Mohammed has been really helpful in outlining how much Edmonton pays for policing and, and seeing it really as a budget item be so much more than um, a lot of the um, like community based like like things that would actually um, help people have housing have access to mental health and um, you know build build a, a community that is actually able to um, uh, to yeah to support um, each other and uh, like actually have good outcomes for folks. Um, it's really frustrating to see that the police budget just be um, the one thing that gets increases year after year um, in place of these these programs that would have a much bigger impact instead of, um, frankly, an institution that um, by design is is actively doing harm. Um, yeah, I'm a, a policy analyst in my day job um, and a community organizer in some of my free time, um, which means I've 
I think, watched and participated in in a, a lot of government consultations at this point. And I think um, a pattern that's disappointing to see is that I think in, in many cases um, there is is often really overwhelming feedback um, to to act and to build a more uh, fair uh, or anti-racist um, or more um, like equitable world. Um, in short, just talking about a couple of different um, issue areas here. Um, and I think what we really often see is um, recommendations get buried away um, or shelved and it's the, the consultation becomes um, uh, a place where where people can feel like they've had feedback, but ultimately nothing is done. And I, I just want to say that it, it would be uh, yeah, really, frankly, gross um, of, of City Council to have solicited, um, solicited the participation of so many community members, had them bring their stories to you here and unpack like very real trauma in a very public way um, and, and fail to, to take these um, uh, all this evidence to heart and, and act. And so um, I'm not necessarily optimistic. I think just having seen this process play out a lot of times, but I really, really want to urge you to um, not repeat uh, that pattern. Um, and also just want to emphasize um, there are a lot of voices that won't be heard in these sessions um, out of fear of repercussions um, and barriers to participating online um, or during this time. Um, so yeah, please, please just really asking you to honor these voices. Um, yeah, I think also just to say um, the, 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 um, the measures um, that I'm asking for and that so many have others have asked for um, are things that, um, that have been brought up um, many, many times before. It's not a new movement. Um, and I think the, the legacy of, of violence and racism um, in policing in Edmonton and um, across Canada is really well documented. Um, I think um, I'm also just would really urge you to use all the barrier, or all the levers you have to um, address these issues. I think it's come up a few times that some of this is at federal and provincial jurisdiction. And so I think um, using uh, like joining multi-city coalitions and um, using all the tools that you have to also push for changes in those jurisdictions is important. Um, I think one other area um, Thanks, that has Bronwyn. been brought up is that the bargaining agreement for the Edmonton Police Association is up in December. Sorry, Bronwyn, and I would urge you to look into the case study in, sorry, you're at the in end, Austin. The end Great. Of the five Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Next is Ezra Hockett. Hi there. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. All right, uh, so my name is Ezra, and I'm a white settler and student at the University of Alberta studying psychology. Uh, I also work with local organizations supporting LGBTQ, 2S plus youth, and communities experiencing homelessness. Um, I want to see our, our municipal tax money redistributed from the Edmonton Police Service into the hands of local organizations which are better equipped to meet our community's needs. Specifically, I want the $75 million budget increase repealed and at least 30% of the police budget reallocated to mental health professionals, as is recommended by Black Lives Matter EAG. Um, I want the Edmonton City Council to commit to suspending any EPS budget increases. It is time for our city to take the steps necessary to sustain our community's health and safety without policing. Ultimately, I want to see the full abolition of police as there is no way to repair a system which is built on the foundation of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. There is a desperate need for well-funded community services supporting mental health, substance use, housing, and poverty. As it stands, these programs are at capacity and inadequate especially in addressing the unique traumas and structural violences experienced by racialized communities, particularly Black and Indigenous. Given how much of this violence is enacted through the Edmonton Police Service, it is time this institution's inflated budget is defunded. We need community care, not criminalization of poverty, mental illness, and substance use. In my outreach work with people experiencing homelessness, I've heard countless stories of the violence they experienced at the hands of the EPS. Police officers have been known to maliciously slash tents, steal or destroy personal belongings, and thoughtlessly dismantle camps despite COVID recommendations against relocation. This is disgraceful, and there is zero accountability as police, as police officers intentionally hide or remove their badge numbers. 
We cannot justify owning a police service which openly degrades and humiliates drug users, such as Consul Mike Roblin just this month. We can't keep sending police to do wellness checks in the place of community mental health workers. In the cases of Regis Cortinsky Paquet, a Black Indigenous woman in Toronto, and more recently, Chantelle Moore, an Indigenous woman in New Brunswick, their deaths would have been prevented had mental health case, uh, had mental health crisis workers been sent to perform well-being checks instead of police officers. This is especially true if we had crisis programs led and informed by the BIPOC community, meaning Black, Indigenous, and people of color. These are some necessary steps to protect Black and Indigenous lives, to help them survive. But we need to go beyond these steps. We need to build an infrastructure that helps BIPOC communities thrive. Our Black and Indigenous community members have already laid the foundation for what our community needs to live without policing. The creative and powerful voices at BLM YAG have done so much in these recent months to expand our collective imaginations. We need free and accessible recreation. We need free transit with expanded late night service and the expansion of the LRT. We need harm reduction approaches to substance use and safe injection sites. We need low income housing that offers a good quality of life. We need to take SROs away from our vulnerable youth and replace them with programs by and for the BIPOC community and mental health support for all students. The people of Edmonton have already demonstrated so much care and support for this community as we have seen in this past week of hearings. We are ready for this. We just need the support of our municipal government to relocate power away from the violent institution of police and into the hands of the public. To be precise, we need to take power away from a government agency which upholds white supremacy and give it to Black and Indigenous community leaders. After centuries of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous subjugation and oppression at the hands of white institutions, we need to do away with these institutions altogether. We need to work with Black and Indigenous leaders to create a future safer, more sustainable, and more community-oriented for all people in our city. There is much work to be done across all systems to dismantle racism, but there's an urgent call to begin by abolishing police and empowering our community at the grassroots level. Um, thank you for your consideration, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Georgia Englott. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Georgia. My pronouns are she, her. I am a student at the University of Alberta studying political science, and I currently live in Ward 11 on Treaty 6 territory. I'm speaking today in support of the referred motion regarding Edmonton Police Commission and specifically in support of investigating police involvement in mental health calls. I want to begin by reading the names of some Canadians who have recently died after police were involved during a mental health crisis. Ijaz Chowdhury, Regis Korchinsi Paquet, Chantal Moore, DeAndre Campbell. These people were all people of color and have all died in the past two and a half months. They and so many others are the victims of a system that has regularly failed them, a system that we must change to avoid further tragedy. A CBC analysis of police-involved deaths found that 70% of victims from 2000 to 2017 struggled with a mental health or substance abuse issue, with Black and Indigenous people being killed at disproportionately high rates. This issue is personally personal to me because I've recently been struggling with severe depression. There have been moments where I feel I would be safer in the hospital because I cannot guarantee my safety. It is a terrifying experience to be unable to trust yourself. People in a crisis don't need to be met by violence and put in handcuffs. They need to be met with compassion and resources to help them develop a plan for their safety with their consent. Looking at the police track record, would you feel comfortable calling 911 for help? knowing that police might come, especially as a person of color. Knowing you need help and asking for help when you're struggling with a mental health crisis is hard enough. People should not have to consider the risks of involving emergency services when looking for help. 
I support Black Lives Matter YEG's calls to increase funding to the crisis diversion team with no police involvement and increase funding and support to 211 and neighborhood-based de-escalation and crisis training. I believe that SROs should be removed from schools and replaced with mental health professionals who are equipped to deal with the issues that many youth are facing. It is past time to adequately fund mental health resources and end police involvement in mental health emergencies. I ask you to vote in favor of this motion, but encourage you to go further. Consider this motion a crucial first step, but by no means the only step that must be taken to achieve justice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Kira Koster. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, see if you can get Hello? a little closer to your mic, though. Okay, just, oh. Is that any better? A uh, little bit. You may have to speak up a bit. That won't be a problem. Great. There um, we go. And can Perfect. you see the slides? Per, uh, there, they were coming up. Yes, oh. yeah, they're there. Okay. They're pinned Perfect. now. Go ahead. I've been following this hearing closely, and like over 4,000 people that have tuned in over the last two weeks, I've heard and support the tireless efforts that BLM YAG has made to get us to this moment. Throughout this hearing, I have seen the struggle and dissonance between the Edmonton you knew and the countless experiences of those who are still being victimized by EPS today. You are currently grappling with the differences between the cops that you have known for decades versus countless stories from Edmontonians you've never met. And you're right. It's two very different cities. Council stated that people with good intentions and a desire to be good guys join EPS. This is flawed, both in reinforcing that individuals are either good or bad, and secondly, that individuals are able to remain good in a system that is deeply flawed and no longer in a position to rehabilitate. Felisa said that they're doing what society asks of them. The right, the individuals in power, and those that have historically supported residential schools, which we now condemn, built the systems and the desire for policing. You might not have built it, but you are in a position to take action now. We need to move beyond thinking that people that harm are bad and the people that get harm are good and stop treating these two groups as immovable. When we label police as good cops, we are limiting their, their capacity to be accountable and grow. Likewise, by continuing to label others as bad, we participate in a system that does not recognize most people both harm others and have been harmed, sometimes at the same time. This is foundational to transformative justice work. As a frontline worker, I carry the ability to affect a client's housing, income, children, and their safety, all due to the respect and power that I have as a professional. If I am labeled as a good worker, I am both more likely to label my clients as bad and less likely to address the ways in which the system and my actions harm. Even if I have the best of intentions, it is near impossible to avoid burnout and creatively support others in a flawed system. I believe that Chief McKee is trying to make change, but the time for moving the needle was 15 years ago. And it is clear to me now more than ever that our police force and commission are incapable of making the systemic change required. One of the systemic issues present in both policing and social work is social isolation and dark humor. This is exacerbated in policing as officers are told they must be suspicious of anyone not on the force, but the effect is similar. When you have an isolated group experiencing trauma, individuals often turn to dark humor as a way to cope. Dark humor reinforces the traumatic memories, confirms that one's experiences separate them from integrating into society and dehumanizes criminals. Dehumanizing over-policed people and thinking of racialized communities as likely criminals is what has brought us to this moment we are in now. The combination of social isolation and, social and society labeling police as heroes not only affirms that they are above criticism, but also positions their mental health and wellness as a sacrifice needed for the good of society. How is this okay to do to police? Let me talk briefly about conditioning and situationally behave based behaviors. During the early months of COVID isolation, I'm sure you remember people talking about how important it was to get dressed for the day in order to be mentally focused on work. Human beings crave systems to simplify our lives and rapidly become conditioned for the situations we are in. When police officers put on their uniform, they will interact with others differently than when they take it off. Symbols of control and superiority rapidly reinforce behaviors in individuals to be more aggressive, more combative, and reinforce the ideologies of who police are. 
This largely renders training ineffective as once the uniform is back on, the instinct is to keep operating as before. Make no mistake, we have all ongoing conditioning as to what the sight of a uniform means. For some, it brings them thoughts of safety and security, but more worrisome is the large communities where a uniform brings instinctual knowledge and past experiences that they are at risk to be harmed when they see one. Despite the best of intentions and a desire to make change, all individuals must adapt to policing when they join. It is enjoining a system that continually reinforces the criminalization of racialized and marginalized communities. These people who desire to do good will either become burnt out or convinced the system works. This dissonance is caused by forced compliance when you don't have to do something that you don't agree with. Otherwise, your ability to pay rent would be affected. The only ways to adapt to this flawed system are to either change your beliefs or change your job. What would you do to what would you do to feed your family? And lastly, I've been hearing concerns that Edmonton doesn't have the resources to make change. TD Bank estimated that in 2016, Indigenous groups put $32 billion into the Canadian economy, and Edmonton currently has the second highest urban Indigenous population. Act now and get the police to stop traumatizing these individuals and allow them to feed your economy. It is up to you to be a leader in industry, integrity, and progress. We're watching. I yield my time. My timer said it was five minutes already. Thank you. Next is Aaliyah Rauf. Hello? Hello, go ahead. <laughs> All right. The idea of defunding our police is long overdue. We have given them our trust, but for too long have seen, heard about, and experienced both minor and devastatingly major abuses of power. We have seen death, discrimination, violence, and authoritarian practices being engaged in by police everywhere, and the EPS is certainly not immune. I, as a 19-year-old woman, walking down the street in tears because I was lost and alone and it was late, was followed by a police van where two grown men heckled, harassed, and laughed at me. I did not feel safe. I did not feel protected. I was at the mercy of two men who were part of an organization that in the past has not had to answer to the consequences of many of their actions. These were two men in a van and the EPS decal just made me nervous. As a woman facing officers of a job often known to abuse their power and get away with it, I was terrified. They did not help. They called me a drunk mess. They called me irresponsible, then called me over and continued to bully me as they wrote me a ticket for jaywalking. They then drove away cackling, leaving me vulnerable and more upset than I had been before. I was sober, and even if I had been drunk, where in this was the proud motto of protect and serve being showcased? My black friend, excited about driving his dad's fancy car to school for the day, pulled over and asked point blank if he was dealing because that's a pretty nice car. And some say in Canada we are immune. Are homeless people sick with addiction and mental health issues needing help and instead receiving violence, bullying and harassment? My friend's father beaten nearly to death, jaw broken in three places, debilitated because he had knocked someone's mirror off of their vehicle while driving. Did this warrant that level of beating? Did this warrant an unarmed man being abused at the hands of multiple officers while alone and handcuffed? Did they really feel like he was that much of a threat? And these are only a few examples from my own experience. Is this the job we have given police, acting not as saviors but as bullies, flexing their proverbial muscles, peacocking their authority over us? This is a career that is supposed to be held to a higher standard. I was under the impression that their purpose was to remain calm, de-escalate, assist, and sometimes detain. I didn't know we had given this occupation the right to dole out vigilante justice. The police are not a judge and jury. Why are they being given the right to decide what punishment fits the crime? And for people of color, why is it so often a punishment of violence? I constantly hear the argument contesting defunding. Why should the entire police force be punished for a few bad apples? My response to that would be if a cop is truly a good cop, wouldn't they be for crime prevention through outreach and social programs being bettered? Wouldn't they be for increased accountability? If they truly want to help and don't just want to exert their power, wouldn't they be for practices that have been shown to drastically reduce crime so that prevention instead of response would be the norm? Why is are police fully equipped with riot gear when our healthcare workers are short on medical masks during a pandemic? Why is the funding for homelessness and housing so embarrassingly low, but our officers are getting a fourth tactical force? Why has the funding of education been cut, but the police budget increased when proper education in a safe and well-structured learning environment has the potential to reduce the need for police force the way it is today? Better education shows a clear link with reduction in crime, yet our educators, our teachers, and aides are losing their jobs while the EPS beefs up. 
Change is scary, but often necessary. We have given the system a chance and it has proved it's systemically racist structuring. It is time for something different. If the police force is truly committed to helping, let's challenge them to accept measures that may actually do so. Reallocate funds to programs and people that have the expertise beyond detainment and show of authority so that people in distress may be helped instead of hurt, so that our most vulnerable may be understood instead of judged. Defunding is not a removal of crime response. It's a different avenue to take, one that may lead not to, sorry, one that may lead to not only to less violent acts taking place during response, but also crime prevention, one not lined with guns and a lack of accountability. When the police are the only option we have to call in times of distress, every disturbance looks like a crime. When the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. We need to amend the idea that a police force is the only thing standing between us and danger. We need to try something different. I have never felt safe when I see an officer. Their presence has only ever been met with tension and anxiety, but the worst they would do to me, maybe some intimidation, maybe a ticket, maybe shake me up, bully me, remind the citizen of their authority. I can't imagine the fear that a black or indigenous person feels when they spot an officer. I once had a cruiser approach me as I waited for my boyfriend outside a store and blatantly asked me my ethnicity because as he said, he was curious because I was exotic looking. When I told him, he replied with, we thought you were maybe native. You look like Pocahontas. It seemed odd to me that after they approached and found out I was not indigenous after all, they left me alone. Otter still was their desire to discover if I was indigenous in the first place. Our current system is not one that operates with equality. Our organization lends itself to further oppression and marginalization of peoples whose struggle should have ended a long time ago. The ripple effects of the deplorable deeds of oppression that were committed against past generations of these communities are still being seen today. Our society is broken, having been built on a foundation of the perceived superiority of white Thank skin you. color, and that foundation has grown like creeping Thank vines you, into Olivia. modern times. Thank Black you. and Indigenous yeah. lives matter. Please defund the police. Thank you. Next, was Drayden Favell able to join us? No, we did not hear from them. No? Okay. Helen Frost is next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to Council today. My name is Helen Frost and I'm here to share my personal perspective and to speak as a former scholar of gender-based violence. I'm a white woman, a newcomer to Canada, and I live in Ward 8 on Treaty 6 territory. I'd like to urge Council to support this motion, but to go further and to act more quickly. I am a scholar of colonial discourse as it relates to gender-based violence, so I hope you won't mind if I talk a little bit about the language of safety and the work that it does. In colonial discourse, still very prevalent today, the safety of certain people is used to justify the violent suppression of others. In colonial logics, it is white women, like me, and white children who must be protected alongside land and property, and that's a patriarchal and white supremacist logic as well. So when we're mobilizing the language of safety in relation to the police, I think we have to carefully interrogate who we're actually protecting and who is really vulnerable to violence beyond these colonial logics. While I believe that the stories that we hear from black and indigenous people about their own experience of lack of safety and fear should be evidence enough, I know that sometimes it's helpful to be reminded of what we know from the research. So in Statistics Canada survey of safety and in public and private spaces, the vast majority of incidents of violent crime reported did not come to the attention of police, and only 5% of women stated that police found out about the most serious incident of sexual assault they experienced. Queer folks, women and people with disabilities, racialized women, and indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people all experience higher levels of gender-based violence. Yet despite their higher risk of violent victimization, these folks are not protected, are not served, are not made to feel safe by the police, and are disproportionately victimized by practices such as carding and through the criminalization of poverty. Studies have also shown that racialized women, specifically black and indigenous women, report when they report violence to the police, their experiences are often taken less seriously within the criminal justice system, and their perpetrators routinely receive less harsh punishments. These exa examples bring into question the efficacy of the police in making life safer for those who experience disproportionate levels of violence in our society and requires us to consider what the police are actually doing and what purpose they actually serve. From my personal perspective, I have a father back home who lives with severe mental illness. He can be paranoid, delusional, and mistrusting of authority. 
He's also capable, loving, and the full-time caregiver to my mother who's living with stage four breast cancer. He is a very big man. He's six foot tall. Although my father is insulated by his whiteness, he's protected by being a white man, I live in fear of him encountering the police as we once did when I was a child, when he began to behave erratically due to the stress of a routine traffic stop and was accused of being drunk or high and forced out of a car. And luckily my mom was able to intervene. If my father was black rather than white, this experience may have resulted in death rather than trauma. I share this story simply as a reminder that for many of us, the police are not an assurance of safety. Last Monday, Rebecca Blakey reminded council that the city of Edmonton is able to act nimbly in a crisis to save lives. I have heard lots of comments over the past few days and weeks about reforming the police, about the need to act slowly, about the need for education. Anyone who's been listening to black and indigenous people in our community knows that this is not a new problem and that the solution is not reform. For the council to act slowly on this matter is to reinforce what many of us already know, that colonial systems value certain lives more than others and are willing to do more to protect certain bodies while criminalizing others. Finally, we are moving into a time of unprecedented economic hardship. This period is likely to disproportionately impact those who are already experiencing barriers accessing services, who live in poverty, in, and who are impacted by the ongoing trauma of colonialism and anti-Black racism. I urge the city to defund the police, and honestly, I am in full favor of full abolition of the police. Um, and to use that funding to support the initiatives already identified by Black Lives Matter Edmonton, they've given us a credible path forward uh, particularly, I support free public transport, affordable housing, mental health services, and a municipal version of 211. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least on this panel is Heather Macklem. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Heather Macklem. My pronouns are she, and I am a white settler born, raised, and educated on Treaty 6 territory. I live downtown and I work for a not-for-profit organization. I am here to endorse the call to defund the Edmonton Police Service and to offer some suggestions about how we can move forward by better funding and utilizing the agencies and organizations that already exist to support the vulnerable members of our community. I believe that this movement should also include funding the formation of new agencies and organizations in our, to serve our city in the place of the police. So police are responsible for 100% of the intake into the criminal justice system, but they are not responsible or accountable for the outcomes of their discriminatory and imprecise in intake process. There are some facts and statistics that we cannot deny and we cannot look away. So let's talk about the overrepresentation of black, indigenous and people of color in the criminal justice system. The following statistics are from the Office of the Correctional Investigator Annual Report 2018-2019. So since 2010, Corrections has reported a decrease in the white population of the, of the prison system by 23%, while the Indigenous populations of those same institutions have increased by 52%. The Muslim inmate population has increased by 74% since 2008-2009. So although Black inmates represent just 8% of the total inmate population, they account for 37% of all discrimination complaints within the correctional system from 2008 to 2018. The intake process is broken and the police are not held accountable for their actions. So let's talk about the fact that 47% of charges laid by EPS are dismissed by the Crown. 100% of intake, 47% of charges dropped, well, when I was a chef, if I had had 47% of my food sent back, I would have not had a job, nor should I. A human life is a lot more important and, and invaluable than a plate of food. So I fail to see why police officers are not held to the same standards as other industries. If any other trade, occupation, or practice had had as high of a failure rate, we would have found a way to replace it a long time ago. Now is the time to defund and dismantle the police. So what do we do instead? Well, I think that a non-police network of community safety, resources, and support already exists. And we could be doing a lot more to utilize, fund, and expand these agencies and organizations. 
So let's look to the journey of a person who experiences criminalization and or incarceration. They come in contact with many, many professionals along their journey. There are numerous people who work to empower and support the same population that is over-policed, oppressed, brutalized, criminalized, and institutionalized. It is the social support workers, the housing coordinators, the mental health and addiction specialists, the frontline staff at homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, drop-in centers, the program facilitators, resource coordinators, crisis and support line operators, systems navigators, donors, funders, stakeholders, and the countless volunteers who give their time to our community to help people find themselves, to see their worth, their value, and their place in the world. So if you would like to find these people, you can find them at places like the Elizabeth Fry Society, the Bissell Center, Boyle McCauley, Homeward Trust, E4C, the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, the Center to End All Sexual Exploitation, Lives in Transition, Canadian Mental Health Association and 211, the John Howard Society, the John Humphrey Society, Creating Hope Society, the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women, our local Native Friendship Centers, the Africa Center, the Center for Race and Culture, Mustard Seed, Hope Mission. I could talk for 30 more minutes about how many organizations already exist. I also think a good place to start would be to redirect a large amount of police funding to the crisis diversion team run by the Canadian Mental Health Association through 211. The team as it is right now is small, the wait, the wait times are long, and they are limited in their abilities to serve. If 211 had the ability to expand their team by adding more to their dispatch team, by having their own fleet of vans with social workers and healthcare professionals on board, they would be able to respond to more calls than they are able to respond to now. I strongly encourage City Council to get in contact with the people who have given their time to speak in these hearings, to get in contact with the organizations I have listed and many more that already exist, and to, to the people who dedicate their lives to supporting the people in our communities. Defund the police. Invest in our communities. Black lives matter. Black trans lives matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions from members of council now for our panelists, starting with Councillor Walters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks to all the speakers for being here. So I'm going to start by saying that, you know, I, the reality that many of our public and private uh, systems and institutions were built by racists and a culture of white supremacy uh, has been validated uh, many times in these hearings. Uh, and certainly something I believe to be uh, true without a doubt. Uh, the pain and fear that I hear through these hearings is also very real and very disturbing uh, to me. Uh, and as Councilor Paquette said earlier, where as a, I guess as a white city councilor, uh, white male city councilor, where, where can this land? Uh, so one of the primary answers provided to that question is the Black Lives Matter Edmonton chapter uh, a plan to defund the police. And so, Miss Yu, I wanted to begin with you, uh, if I may. Hi, yes. If you look at the whole action plan, which I, I, I'm sure you have, uh, is that, in fact, our only answer? To defund the police? Yes. Uh, yes, it is my belief, um, and in, I think in, it's... In all of its parts, so I'm talking about the whole action plan, is that, is that our only answer, or is there a version of that uh, that is more realistic in the short term, uh, is clear in the short term, or... Because uh, what I understand is it's abolished them very rapidly, uh, so I want to ask you if that is the only answer. I do believe that that is the way forward. Um, I know that we can get really caught up in the logistics of things, um, but I would like to remind all the councillors that uh, there are huge consequences to our complacency and to taking things slowly. Um, Black and Indigenous lives are at risk, and that's something that we can know we can we can never accept as. Um, collateral to the way our systems work. Uh, I think there's been a lot of research and um, a lot of action around the world on what defunding the policing can look like. Um, you said that Black Lives Matter, of course, has um, 
their demands laid out, and I am absolutely in full support of uh, the work they've done and what they've put together. Um, but if you're looking for logistics, I think there are many, many, many resources available. M MDP 150 is a great resource for coming out of the States, out of Minneapolis. Um, you, you, that, do, you do appreciate, I presume, that we will, like it or not, get caught in logistics. And Of course. Right. But what I'm saying is that those logistics, if you are not finding them here locally have been uh, researched and put in action in many other communities. So if I could shift to Ms. Bross, because you had uh, uh, cited uh, your uh, background as a researcher, it is also your belief that abolition uh, and dismantling uh, versus reconciliation, innovation, demilitarization, uh, there aren't two pathways here. So one pathway I understand from the plan to defund the police is abolition. And others have started to suggest, although vaguely, but still an idea of reconciliation of innovation and policing as a service to community safety and demilitarization. I've seen more of the latter in, in other cities that have been sort of more active in responding to police brutality in the past. So maybe Again, is is there only one pathway, or is there a few pathways for elected bodies uh, in charge of police financing to consider? Okay, so what I'll say is, I previously worked as a researcher. I work as a public servant, um, so I do have sympathy and understanding for the fact that it take it takes time to. Uh, make change and you have policies and procedures that you go through that take time. What I'd also say is what we've seen recently within the with the COVID-19 response is when there is political will, we can act quickly. And I think that is the point that Rebecca Blakey made last week. Um, to add to that, I think the problem with an argument for reform, and this is from my background as a scholar of colonialism and colon colonial systems, is that it's very hard to reform a system that is embedded in historical logics of colonialism and white supremacy. I think that we can build a different system to support safety and support prevention. And I think, you know, Heather, she listed all the organizations in your community who already have the expertise to do that. And I think there are opportunities to co-design with communities a viable solution and to act quickly if we draw on the expertise already present and we're willing to, you know, use a community-centered approach to solving this issue. And I do think a lot of the, um, uh, the recommendations made by Black Lives Matter Edmonton are actually a credible uh, way forward. Um, and where there is jurisdictional creep, I think there's an opportunity for the city to act as a powerful stakeholder to the provincial and uh, the federal government to make a strong argument for different understandings and different modes of safety in our community. I presume I've run out of time, Mr. Mayor. I'm afraid so. But, yeah, okay. uh, thank you, thank thank you, you for your answers and your presentations. Next up is Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you all panelists. Again, I would ask all of you questions all day long, except we have one round of five minutes. So um, I'm going to go back to Helen Frost, if that's okay. And um, I'm going to ask, a, I guess it's a, it's a complex question, and I hope you can unpack this, but um, you talked about these colonial structures. For a lot of people listening in or, or vaguely paying attention to this debate, the structure seems to work. They don't understand why we need to change the structure. They just think that there's uh, some people complaining, and why should we throw everything out for some loud mouse, right? That's the perspective. Um, another aspect, and I'm getting to my question, but I have to build it. The other aspect is that uh, as uh, elected, you know, and you'll know this from your studies, elected officials, no matter where they are, um, they have to balance this concept of leadership and, um, and, and following the will of their uh, electors. And if the majority 
um, are satisfied with the status quo, it puts them in a bit of a quandary. Where do they draw the line on leadership and where do they draw the line on uh, listening to the majority, even if it's at the expense of the minority? And again, I'm not adding a value into this. I'm just state, stating the situation. Okay, so we've got those two ideas. And then we've got this third one where uh, this takes a multi-level uh, government approach to really fundamentally change things. And if you have an ideology of, of uh, a populist law and order platform versus an ideology of let's do what's most efficient and works best for most people platform, one is a lot more easy to sell in a populist fashion. So take all those concepts together. How do you find the way through? Um, I think that's the role of elected officials. I, I, I'm sorry yeah. to be like, it's a little no, bit. I agree. I, agree with you. I think it is your to get those systems. What, what I would say is, you know, as uh, someone who is deeply interested in policy, but also in um, the discourses of democracy, what I would say is in this particular um, in this particular context, when we're thinking about what, what does leadership mean in our community, if a system not only doesn't work for those who are most marginalized in the community, and the argument I was making is those who most experience violent victimization do not feel safe and are not made safe by the police, then we need to ask what what is a system that will work and be effective for everyone. And so you have a choice, I think, as... Um, as counselors, as leaders, am I interested purely in um, what is good for those who benefit most from the systems in our society? Or do I want a society where those who are most vulnerable, who are experience the highest levels of vulnerable victimization, are made to feel safe? And that is an ethical choice that you have to take forward, not only a political one. Um, and that's, I know that's not a really strategic answer, but you know, I think you all have to be accountable to your own decisions as well as those of the community. And as public servants, I think we should all be aware of how to make lives as safe as, safe as possible for those who are most disadvantaged in our societies. I agree. Now, finally, um, this is a, obviously is a very complex issue. Um, but you are, your, your contention and the contention of multiple people in the community is that we already have the community organizations that can design a functional alternative that actually serves the public better, even though it may sound scary to abandon what we know. And uh, so your contention is that we can build this um, in order to replace something that just is not efficient, but is very well intentioned with, with well intentioned people, but the system itself makes it ineffective as a good tool. That would be your contention that we could do this. Absolutely. And I think the thing I want to add to that is not only is it inefficient, it's costly. And from my my perspective as a homeowner, as a you know taxpayer, it's very frustrating to see money being spent on a system that has been shown to be ineffective in the work that it does. And I agree, it may, be, may well be well-intentioned, but it's economically ineffective. It's, you know, in my opinion, fiscally irresponsible. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to all of the panelists, uh, again, for sharing your comments today. Uh, it's Mr. Uh, it was Mukibi, is that correct? Did I pronounce it correctly? Is Mr. Mr. Mukibi, Mukibi, speaker number three, are you still there? He doesn't appear to be on the call anymore. Sorry, Councilor Mack. Oh. Okay, uh, though I had most of my questions for him. Uh, can I jump off and I might need to jump back on yep, if possible? Sure. Uh, yep. Thank you. Yeah, I'll let you reset there, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I might next. not, but thank you. Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Ms. Ross first. Um, 
because it, it's you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to think in my own mind, assuming that we do that you to to restructure you have to take the structure apart. Let's take that as a given. Uh, I'm not sure everybody will, but let's just take it as a given for the sake of my for, of my questions. Um, the the question then is what do we restructure? What are we trying to do with a restructure? What is it we're trying to put back in place? Um, and I, you know, I think yeah, we've I'm talked about safety. I think we've talked about um, um, making yeah. sure. I think it's. I think it's about um, uh, also making sure that no one comes to harm. And clearly, there's a lot of people being harmed right now. But what I'm really interested in, if we're going to dismantle, is I don't. I think it's naive to think that we cannot create something new that actually is in, is empowered to make sure that nobody comes to harm. Um, and, and uh, I mean, obviously where we're particularly failing right now is with our disadvantaged communities, with our marginalized communities, we're not doing that. Um, but I think there probably are some other things that are being, are, and, and that there maybe is a better way of making sure that we protect those, those folks from harm. But there are other places where we do harm to each other that we're going to need to have some way to be able to respond to and deal with that are not about the marginalized community. I mean, there's people like me that look like me that are out there doing harm to people. And I, and I, you know, I think that the interesting question that I have is if we're restructuring, how do we restructure? What do we restructure with? Because I'm not sure that can just be handled by all of those agencies that are out there that are working with marginalized community right now. So do you have any, it's a long question, but any thoughts on what that restructure looks like? Because I think that has to be our ultimate objective. Um, so I feel like I probably, there are probably folks on this panel who are more authoritative and Fair have enough. more yeah. like, knowledge than me to speak on this. So I'll make my answer pretty quick. Um, what I What I would say is that what we know from the research is that prevention is a much stronger way to intervene into uh, violence of all sorts in our society mm -hmm. than is enforcement. Um, yeah. So whatever the long-term thing looks like, you know, focusing on prevention, reducing economic inequality, providing services around mental health, I think that's a substantial first step. And I think there are folks on this panel who have more expertise than me to talk about what, what the pragmatics of this would look like. Yeah, uh, Ms. Ms. Coster, you were the other person I was thinking of asking that question to because you've done some thinking about that as well. So any thoughts on the same question? So realistically speaking, you don't, if, if you're focusing on a needs-based society, then you're trying to address and meet those needs. If we see that there's an increase in violent attack, then we need to address those needs. I've heard a lot about white collar crime and what do we do about sexual assault and what do we do about, you know, traffic fines. And the more you really tease out what is the need and what is going on, then you can find a solution that adequately meets that. Right now, our EPS do not adequately, they, they respond after violence has occurred. They don't prevent violence. And the only way they claim to prevent violence is by being a threatening and controlling and oppressive force so that people never think of violence. But that's not actually making change. That's just reinforcing that people will not act in criminal ways because they won't get caught. That's punitive, not restorative, not transformative. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Okay, well, th thanks for that. I'll continue to ponder this question. It's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, uh, Mr. Mukibi is back on the call, so go ahead. Yes, that, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Mukibi, you, you are there now. I just want to make sure. Yes, I am. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so, I, I, I was trying to jot down as much as I could while you were chatting, but it wasn't coming through perfectly clear. So, you may have said it in your presentation, but I might have missed it it's because I, I heard um, there were a couple of things that I took away from what you were talking about. Uh, you were asking the question, how can police stay focused on sort of the serious crime, let community groups focus on other issues. But then near the end, you had been talking about, I believe, three items, good governance, transparency and accountability. And I, I might have missed if you did get to talk about it or, or maybe you didn't, uh, what what those look like to you what what does good governance transparency and accountability look like in this new model where 
police are going to be focused on the serious issues that you said and the community groups are going to focus on others. How, how, how do we best do that in your mind? In my approach, which I was thinking about, I was looking at deploying, having a police system whereby it fits the, which serves the 21st century, whereby it has to do with governance, whereby there's separation between institutions, like there's more responsibility from the city council, which allocates resources to them, then they seek accountability on various aspects, whereby they come out to monitor what activity they do, what do they use, the services, the resources which they're allocated to, do they meet the needs of the community? And then from that stakeholder perspective, we can be able to seek for accountability for the resources because it's very useless for us to put money whereby we don't know what they do. For instance, like in the school communities, like the cops who are in the who work within the school communities, they don't give any accountability to the public school to Edmonton public schools and all that. So where does that, all that information go? Like for instance, me as a parent who has a black child. I'm just imagining that what happens to the information which is correct about my child? Does it end up into the justice system? And then at the end of the day, some people are talking about the backlog which is within the, the justice system. Because at the end of the day, there's no accountability for these people whereby 47% if you're not performing good. If, for instance, like all that 47% of the people whereby the cases are dismissed, why should we keep on putting funds in parties in such an institution? Does this serve the interests of the 21st century, whereby we seek for accountability for all the resources which they are supposed to be utilized? So that's what I want to know, like all the information to be put on, maybe on a central website, whereby I come out to access the information, for instance, like on based on race. And then uh, for aspect of governance, we should be able to have these people like accountable for all whatever actions they take. Like, like there's an aspect which I read about um, an aspect to do with advanced immunity. So how do you have somebody, for instance, like if you're a lawyer and you have to be on the bar, you have an issue whereby you are accountable to your client, but these are people, there's zero accountability in aspect of their actions. If they come to my door, I have to open. But at the end of the day, they may have a way to treat me, but I don't understand their code of conduct. So all these things have to be looked at whereby they fit the needs of the 21st century. That's what I was seeking for, an aspect to do with good governance, accountability, and transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, that's all from you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Other questions for members of this panel? Not seeing any. Mine have been asked and addressed, so thank you. Um, I think we will recess now then until panel 12, which is scheduled for 3.45. So at that time, uh, in about an hour, uh, feel free to tune in and uh, at edmonton.ca slash meetings. And thank you again, all of you, for your very thoughtful um, comments this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Okay, we're in recess until... Um, till 3.45. Thanks.
Good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, we'll roll call right away for members of council. Sorry we're a couple minutes late getting back here, but we'll get going with the final panel right away. Um, okay, we'll roll call first members of council, starting with Councillor Banga. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon. Councillor Carmel. Good afternoon. Right. <laughs> Councillor Katarina. <laughs> Councillor Katarina, are you there? I hear a very small dog, but not a Councillor Katarina. Well, I shouldn't. I, I'm here, Mr. Mayor, uh, and that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment either way. I yeah. shouldn't have made assumptions about the size of the dog either. <laughs> Councillor Zadik? I am here. Thank you. Um, Councillor Essinger? Present. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Present. Welcome. Councillor Henderson? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Councillor Knack? Good afternoon. I'm here. Good afternoon. Councillor McKean? I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, Councillor Nickel. Present. Welcome, Councillor Paquette. I would assume Councillor Katarina's bite is worse than his bark. I am here. <laughs> uh, I might be an expert witness in <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Councillor Walters is uh, last but not least. Are you there? I am. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome to members of council and uh, members of the public that have joined us as well as uh, delegations from Edmonton Police Service, Edmonton Police Commission and City Administration who are also uh, here in, in person to listen as well as uh, virtually tuned in. For participants in the uh, hearing, uh, I'll explain the public hearing process on the referred motion regarding the Edmonton Police Commission. Uh, speakers have been paneled here and will present to council in the order in which they were registered. Each speaker will be given five minutes to speak. The clerk will run a timer in the room, but you may wish to have your own timer to pace yourself accordingly. Once you've finished speaking, please mute your microphone, but stay on the line as council may wish to ask you questions. After all speakers within the panel have made their presentations, um, each councillor will be given five minutes to ask one round of questions if they wish. After each panel, a short recess will be called to allow us to set up for the next panel of presenters. If you wish to listen and follow along in the meeting after your panel is complete, please use the live stream, which is available on edmonton.ca slash meetings. This process will require some patience for everyone to participate effectively in the virtual meeting uh, and ensure that we have a chance to hear from everybody. Uh, I would ask that you please refrain from using the chat function during the meeting as it can create issues of fairness and decorum uh, if it's being used while someone else is trying to speak and it can also glitch up the live stream. So again, please refrain from using the chat function. Additionally, uh, as a matter of courtesy, please remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. 
if at any point you're having technical difficulties, the Office of the City Clerk does have additional resources available to facilitate uh, participants um, joining the panel and being able to participate. So if you do have any issues, please reach out using the contact information provided in your registration. A speaker's list for each panel will be provided on edmonton.ca slash, slash meetings for your reference. And what I'll do now is um, check in briefly with each one of our speakers to make sure that we can hear and uh, if you so choose, see you. Um, and, uh, and also, I'd just ask you to note the order uh, so that as the person before you is finishing, you can get yourself ready and be ready to unmute yourself. So uh, our first speaker uh, was going to be Adil Purvai, but uh, I understand he's not able to join us. That's correct. Okay. And uh, uh, we also were expecting Elliot Allen, but Elliot is also unable to join us. Yes, they've withdrawn their registration. Oh, withdrawn, okay. Uh, third is Eli Tompkins, or Ellie. Hi, yes, I'm here. Welcome. Uh, is it Eli or Ellie? It's Eli. Eli, super. I apologize in advance. Please do uh, correct me on any uh, pronunciation. Next uh, after Eli is Molly Swain. Is Molly Hello, there? I'm here. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Next is L. Uh, Chernenkov. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, next uh, is Victoria De Jong, who has not checked in yet, so we'll see. Perhaps Victoria will be able to join us. Next is Hannah Boyd. I'm here. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, next is Christy Morin from Arts on the Ave. Hey, it's, it's Christy, and I'm just speaking as Christy. Oh, just Christy, as Christy. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Hey, uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, then speaker number nine was to have been Jordana Gobra, but um, the, uh, that speaker has withdrawn. Uh, next is Shani Marawira. Hi. It's Shiny. Shiny? Yep. Thank you for that. Um, next is Rohit Gill. Hi, I'm here. Welcome. Next is Ali Sitter. They did not check in. Has not checked in yet. Okay. Next is Frank Page. Hello. Hi there. And next is Mary Howe. They also have not checked in. Okay. And last but not least is Brittany Rudick. I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so you'll each have five minutes, and uh, if some of the folks who haven't checked in yet are able to join us, we'll do our best to accommodate them. Uh, and as I said, stand by, because there may be questions at the end. Uh, and as I've indicated to the earlier panels today, we are likely to continue discussion on this matter um, Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, I will ask uh, councillors for a motion to make some schedule adjustments to next week to make that possible before we conclude uh, today's meeting. But uh, we should be able to get all that done before 5.30, I hope. So anyway, um, uh, we'll start with Eli. Welcome. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm Eli. I'm 14. I use he, they, she pronouns. I live in Millwoods in one of the most police areas of Edmonton. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground, Guiding Police, and driving up to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Metis, Dene, and Dakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Metis, Inuit, who footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I'm here in favor of this motion. What we have heard from so many people already is what I'll be trying to get at today. For part of my time today, I'll be telling you a story about a man who got arrested. My mom, my sister, and I told the police about a crime that this man committed. We were close to this man, and telling the police was not our first choice. For this man to be investigated, they took away his phone and laptop, so all of his forms of communication were taken away. They kept him at the police station for one night and sent him home the next day. The day after that, my mom, my sister, and I got brought to the Zebra Center, where I made a statement about this man. The lady that I was talking to asked my mom, my sister, and me if there's anything we need to know about this man, because we were close to him. 
We told her that this man has a history of suicidal thoughts and major depression. A full week went by of knowing that this man had no communication with anyone and, had, and no one had given us any information. So we decided to email the officer in charge and ask them to send someone to the house to check up on him, even though that wasn't their job. When an officer came to the house and rang the doorbell, no one answered. So the officer went to the house and found papers and notes and a wallet on the table. And the officer went into the garage and found this man's dead body. This man is my father. We still don't know to this day if my dad was given any support or if anyone came to the house. We don't know. We don't even know if the information that we gave to the lady at the zebra center was passed on. I'm telling you this story today because... I want at least 70% of the money that goes to them into police service to be put into better things. I would be happy if even 10% of that money was taken away from them. I would say that every person in Edmonton has an idea about where their tax dollars could go. I could name 50 ideas off the top of my head easily. A few of those ideas where this money could go are getting all police officers thorough de-escalation training, a permanent guiding counselor at every school, programs for homeless people, making sure everyone has access to suicide prevention, climate change prevention, that's just a few. Next, I wanna talk about something we've heard hundreds upon thousands of times. The police discrimination against indigenous people, LGBTQ plus people, and people of color. As the Edmonton Police Service has heard way too many times, their whole system needs to change. They have apologized many times, but their actions never change. As a 14-year-old queer trans person, I am afraid to have any interaction with police. Anytime I see any sort of police officer, I get afraid and avoid them. That includes if I am in danger or need help from the police. I still don't understand why me and so many other people need to be trying to persuade you to make changes in the Edmonton Police Service. I hope that what I've said today will persuade you. Please pass this motion. Thank you for listening to me today. I yield my time. Thanks, Eli. Next is Molly Swain. Thank you. Uh, my name is Molly Swain. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a Métis woman, an auntie to four Métis nieces here in Edmonton, a resident of Ward 7, and a PhD student of 20th century Métis political history. So I've heard from both councillors and school board trustees over the past two weeks that it is important to move forward with evidence and information-based approaches to the issue of policing in Edmonton, and I agree. I join many other Edmontonians in encouraging city council to take up and engage with the decades of abolitionist analysis and literature that already exist, and to reach out to abolitionist organizers, especially Black, Indigenous, migrant, disabled, and LGBTQS plus organizers rather than consulting with police. Police advising on and investigating police overwhelmingly leads to conclusions of a lack of wrongdoing on the part of police, which we've seen again and again across the continent. So-called independent oversight committees are no better and instead lend further legitimacy and justification to police violence and abuse. In Alberta, on the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team, which is the supposedly independent body that investigates complaints of police violence and misconduct, 100% of the investigators are former law enforcement officers. We cannot trust cops or former cops to be independent adjudicators of the utility of policing. Anything that expands the reach, budget, or powers of the police must be avoided if we are to see any real and lasting change, and that includes engaging with them as consultants. These same logics that underpin policing are the basis of the school resource officer program in Edmonton schools. The SRO program is secretive and untransparent in both its intentions and actions, and the feel-good rhetoric of community safety and youth support aren't reflected by either anecdotal evidence or by the little we know publicly about the work and tactics of SROs. Instead, what we do see is the active criminalization of our children in ways that traumatize and impact their capacity to feel safe and comfortable in their learning environment, and the placement of cops who commit violence and misconduct in our children's schools. To the first point, the Bait Phone program is one of the only officially documented examples of child criminalization. But we know anecdotally that SROs routinely find children for minor infractions and force them to spend time laboring and or under the surveillance of officers. SROs set up stings to detain and punish groups of students, like those who might vape, for example. SROs also encourage students to see one another as threats, encouraging and sometimes coercing children to snitch on one another's behavior and to sign confessions for conduct infractions without informing children's parents or allowing children to contact their parents. These are blatantly unethical intimidation, surveillance, and criminalization tactics that are focused overwhelmingly on low-income and BIPOC children. 
These actions tell these children that they are not safe in their schools and that mistakes, boundary pushing, accusations from other students, or simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time will lead to criminalization and punishment at the hands of people with guns who are not accountable to students or their families. As to the second point, it's become increasingly clear that SROs are dangerous cops. There have been several, pub several public instances of SROs assaulting people while in the position. Dan Williams was found guilty of kicking a woman in the head in what the judge called a, quote, deliberate act delivered as an anger response in 2005. He was an SRO at St. Joseph's High School at the time. In 2009, Terry Michio was found to have instigated a fight with and then beat the crap out of a teenager in East Glen High School, pepper spraying him, putting him in a prohibited headlock, pepper spraying him a second time and shoving him to the ground. Other SROs have committed egregiously violent acts during their policing careers, including actions leading to a death in custody. That was Lyle Souter in 2014. He was an SRO at Victoria School of the Arts. And the infamous sweatbox case, sweatbox case, where three officers picked up nine homeless Indigenous people, kept them in the back of a sweltering van for hours, and then dumped them at the outskirts of the city. And that's Souter again and Patrick Hannes in 2010. And both were SROs at the time of the investigation. Considering how infrequently complaints against police and SROs are lodged, these stories are damning and likely just the tip of the iceberg. We also see what is possibly a deeply disturbing trend of officers who are under investigation for violence and misconduct continuing as SROs, as seems to be the case with Williams, Souter, and Hannes. Yesterday's Edmonton Public School Board vote to not suspend the SRO program while conducting this research is incredibly disappointing. However, that vote, in conjunction with Trustee Johnner's horribly racist assertion that SROs are required to keep violent refugee children from harming others, is indicative of two things. Both that systemic racism permeates all levels of decision-making related to the police, and indeed to the maintenance of the Canadian settler state, and that trustees and decision-makers generally actually already know what these programs are for, even if they claim ignorance. SROs and policing exist to maintain and bolster white supremacy through illusions of savage and violent racial others from whom whiteness must be protected. While the EPSB may have voted to continue funding the SRO program, City Council can till still take a stand against the racism exhibited in the EPSB and embodied by police by defunding SROs right away and taking up Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter YEG's other crucial suggestions towards the abolition of policing and building of ground up community safety. As we look to find more data information about policing in Edmonton, we must ensure that it's non-affiliated, non-former and non-police who are doing that investigation and research. I urge City Council to take yesterday's board vote not as justification or permission to maintain the status quo, but as additional motivation to begin defunding the police and addressing systemic racism in Edmonton's governing bodies immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Elle Chernenkoff. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Um, not sure if we can yet. All right. Oh, here we go. Let me know. I think the clerks uh, are presenting the slides on your behalf. Yes. Yes, we can now Have see. Have you got the first slide? Yeah. Go All on. right. I'll let them know when to change. Thank you. I'm a change management professional and a 35-year resident of Allendale. I rarely, if ever, have had contact with Edmonton City Police. I don't consider myself an idealist. My work is to make things happen in organizations. I'm here because I'm concerned. Five, please. We are in a moment, a moment of change. And I believe if you miss this moment, you won't have control over the direction of another. Change will come. It always does. As you've heard, the next generation will ensure that. The question is, will you be a part of it, or will the change happen around you? Slide, please. I'm gratified to work with some of the best change managers in the world. They will tell you, and I will tell you, culture eats policy for breakfast. Slide, please. That means that it doesn't matter what rules you have, what laws or regulations you have in place, an entrenched culture will always find a way to do what it wants to keep the culture alive. Chief McPhee attempted to alter this change management truism by saying, change structure first and culture automatically goes with the structure. However, Chief McPhee also said, change management is more successful when there is a shock to the system. He is absolutely correct. Change management has proven that organizations like EPS are amazingly resilient. A 30% budget shock 
to be extremely effective in creating change, improving culture, building agility and innovation in the EPS, it could move the organization towards the goals that have been expressed here. A shock like that would force prioritization and the refocusing of the goals of EPS. Slide, please. This is not an argument either for the police or against the police. This is about the community telling you, desperately begging you to improve public safety and eliminate public harm. Can EPS alone do this? Budgets are moral documents. Do we tolerate harm? As counsel, you have the very difficult task of choosing what the balance should be and to create the buy-in engagement needed to better the system. Language is extremely powerful in making change. Slide, please. Let's talk about right funding, not defunding EPS. Throwing money at a problem will not resolve it. I am personally aware that EPS has asked us to throw money at the problem since the 80s. It's past time for EPS to innovate. Slide, please. We have two conflicting issues here. EPS is the tool that we currently use to problem-solve safety issues in Edmonton, but EPS is trained to control issues of public safety. Do you control public safety, or do you resolve public safety issues? These mandates require two different cultures. When I did my research and talked to others about EPS, I was actually horrified by the specific incidents that came to light. Power over others is intoxicating. We need to have a different culture that addresses community problems, a culture that balances the good, bad, right, wrong culture of EPS with a culture that builds trust with Edmontonians. Slide, please. Change managers will tell you that controlling others to resolve every situation will fail. The only option when problems arise that Edmontonians are aware of is to Call the police. Let's give them other options. Let's educate them. De-escalations require professionals that have a different focus, a culture that sees shades of gray, not just black and white, good and bad. It needs a culture of problem solving. Are police needed? Yes. Are they appropriate for all the call-outs they do now? Absolutely not. We need change in the, in the people who respond to 30 to 50% of the calls that EPS currently takes that require other types of resources. We are in the moment. We need to build trust with our community and create community peacekeeping, not just policing as a general response. Slide, please. Thank you. I've been especially pleased to see Councillor Paquette, McKean, Henderson, Walters, Councillor Banga, especially Councillor Banga, along with our impressive Mayor Don Iveson that are actively being engaged in these sessions and seeking action items to start to address the resolutions to the issues. My apologies to any of the other engaged counselors that I may have missed. In closing, now is the time to innovate. Now is the time to make change while you still have a chance to. We are in Thank the you. moment. Last slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I'm afraid I'm afraid you're out of time. No problem. Thank the you. The last Bill. slide will be there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Victoria. De, is it De Jong or De Jong? Oh, right. We'll never know because she's not able to join us. Uh, next is Hannah Boyd. Then. Hi, I'm here. Go ahead. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, I'd like to speak on an experience of my own with EPS and why I don't believe defunding or abolishing the police will solve any issues. And I have some ideas too of what kind of things we could do instead. Edmonton is the fastest growing major city in Canada. Isn't that awesome for us? But as our city grows, so does our need for police. In the year 2017, there was a 3% increase in 911 calls and violent crime victimization increased by a whopping 8.9%. Decreasing slash defunding the police budget will decrease response times and endanger citizens. Without police at all, some people may turn to violent vigilante responses. 
I worked next door to a pharmacy that was robbed last year at gunpoint. I was able to call 911 and the police responded quickly and professionally. The dispatcher was able to keep me calm while waiting for the police to come. And although the gunman fled the scene, they were later able to apprehend him, thereby preventing further crime and trauma. Now, this situation could have turned out much more different, but it needed definitely needed professional intervention. And I believe in this case, the police were the best suited to this response. And what about cases where police shouldn't be the first to respond? One point that is brought up in the pro-defund police platforms is that we should reinvest money from defunding police into social, social services for mental health, domestic violence, and homelessness. Something that I've learned while researching the EPS is we have some multidisciplinary units such as PACT. PACT pairs police with mental health professionals. This ensures that citizens get the proper help they need while the mental health care worker has protection if they need it. Cutting police funds might also lead to officers responding to calls alone. Not only does this put more risk on the solo officer, but it leads to less accountability. Police working as partners and perhaps even more multidisciplinary units will bring about more accountability for police actions. If we invest in more programs like PAC, we will be able to more properly assess and approach crises without force and can ensure proper help is given. Instead of pitting communities against police and vice versa, we should shift towards more community policing. We need to look at how police can serve individual communities and adapt our policing towards that. If we create special liaison units that are more involved with marginalized communities, we can reduce profiling and police fear and build better relationships with police. Involving youth in police programs such as Calgary's YARD program, Youth at Risk Development, will help shift towards a proactive and preventative police force. All of these programs take training and development, which costs money. So rather than defund police, I propose we diversify the budget towards more of these programs. I'm grateful for the Edmonton Police Service and all that they do, and I would love to see it evolve into something that would be even better for everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next is Christy Morin. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I am a resident in Eastwood for the last 26 years, and our family identifies as a Métis family in this community. We are very, very excited about the new policing community, the community policing model that has come in the last three years to our community. Uh, we have seen incredible uptake with community actually connecting with police in so many different areas. I'm just going to list a few of them because I was sitting um, and I just, you know, sort of came up with a few that uh, I don't have any, like, thing, you know, so here we go. Uh, the list is, uh, I sit on the board for the Alberta uh, Business Association. Uh, the police worked with the businesses to create an initiative called Businesses Together, which is working on blocks together to be able to create ex extraordinary safety together as neighbours um, in businesses so that we can actually watch out for each other, be able to uh, problem solve together, come up with great celebration pieces and ways to be able to work together as units and communication. On 118th Avenue, it's 27 blocks of real estate. So it's not like we're in a mall. And so the police were able to work with us to find ways to communicate amongst the businesses, which really supported the business association and trying to find ways to be able to meet their goals um, in creating a, a more prosperous business association um, as well. So we also have the Deep Freeze Festival. The police come out, they're part of our deep freeze races. They're part of our uh, roasting marshmallows with the kids in the neighborhood. Our community is really unique because we are a vulnerable community and we have a real wonderful diverse and richness to it. So police are very engaged in all levels with us. We're not saying that the police have met every task needed in our community, but the community, new community policing model has really been fantastic. Cops at the carrot. Uh, we have monthly meetings with police at, at the carrot. Last just before COVID, we had 53 people of diverse backgrounds and ethnicities coming together to problem solve back alley problems, um, having lots of problems with break-in enters, uh, theft. And until you've actually lived it, 
you don't realize how fantastic it is to be able to go to experts and people in the community, police being an expert, and then also your neighbors being experts, being able to work together to find solutions and finding ways to do this. Uh, we also have seen policing with Won't You Be My Eastwood Neighbor. We had huge, huge issues down 82 Street between 118 and the Yellowhead. We did door knocking and we had two officers with us throughout the whole entire door knocking to bring community together and bring them out to celebrate in the back alleys and do marshmallow roasts and music. We had Isis rain out. It was just a really great way to celebrate community and also for neighbors to get to know neighbors because there's power in people and there's power when we all come together and the police are integral in that. I mean, it, it was it was really wonderful. I have photos I was going to send, but I thought, ah, that's okay. Uh, we also do, the, the, the partnership is really important with community and policing, we find. So we've been engaged in city cleanups, uh, graffiti projects, back alley initiatives, problem properties initiatives, uh, drug house initiatives. We were dealing with a notorious uh, slum landlord and the information that is coming from community now that they're feeling safer, that they're able to share about problem properties has been exceptional. And and being able to find task forces around that and layer it with fire, uh, you know, city, bylaw, all those layerings are really what's going to make a difference in the future. Uh, the, the whole piece of us working together in our community is really, really important. I mean, we are in a community of lots of vulnerabilities, mental health, brokenness. Uh, our kids in our schools, we're working right now with food security issues, uh, couch surfing because they don't feel safe at home. So there's so many programs that we are connecting in with, and it's about the partnerships. And if we decide as a community that we're going to remove the partnership of Edmonton Police Service, we are going to be seeing a huge hole in the community. Lots of new people are moving into the neighborhood and they want to feel like they belong. And when they have an issue, they need to be able to call someone to give them support. Oftentimes, I mean, the whole scope creep that happens in so many of our lives, right? All of a sudden we're scope creeping into so many different areas because there's need. When there's need, there's answers and there's ways to do it. So if there's ways to continue these initiatives, the revitalizations in these communities are super important. As you guys know, I mean, you've been out to the festivals, you've been out to the avenue and it needs to continue even more so. Like I would say we need more of those initiatives. We need more of those partnerships. We need more of those stakeholder groups and to be able to do it differently. So with us, we have, you know, a really strong diverse African community. Being able to do smaller group meetings we found are much more efficient and much more um, acceptable to those communities than doing large, big task force meetings. So finding different ways and being able to be nimble has been really important to us. The one concern that I have, if we decide that we're going to say we're going to defund police, um, is that we have worked so hard to bring the police to community and to create this policing model with our chief. So I would hate to see, as we've seen a brain drain of a whole bunch of intellects moving out and to, you know, somewhere in, down to Silicon Valley, I would hate to see a love drain of people who are in the community because we love our community, but they begin to feel more and more unsafe. And then they move to a different community, to other areas that they, they feel safer in. And so that is a concern that I've had. I think the ground up policing model that we are seeing I'm needs sorry, to be Christy, I, encouraged. You're, you're at the, you're thanks. At the time. Hey, thanks. Thank so you. I just, just encouraged. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Um, next is Shiny Marawira. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shiny Maravita. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an immigrant from Sri Lanka here on Treaty 6 territory, studying a master's in occupational therapy. I'm here to add to the voices in support of this motion and to encourage the council to go further and defund and demilitarize the EPS. As many others have done, I'd like to use my personal experiences in order to, in order to convey this message. For a year, I volunteered as a distress line listener with the Canadian Mental Health Association here in Edmonton. As a distress line listener, we received training with regards to crisis management, suicide prevention, de-escalation, emotional support, and much more. As a listener, we would often be the first and at times only contact an individual has regarding their crisis situation. Therefore, it was imperative to validate, affirm, and provide emotional support to all those who called. As a service, the distress line is built upon providing short-term crisis intervention and support to all those who are in distress, and it pledges to always listen and let the caller be heard. 
The police are also meant to act as a service for crisis intervention. However, they are told to always be on guard and protect themselves first. So naturally, their instinct during these situations is to draw out their weapons that they have been handed, which is estimated to occur about 2.5 times a day. To make matters worse, this fear perpetuates and exacerbates the stigma surrounding mental health and those struggling with the same to a point where the police have access to their firearms, even during a mental health or social issues related call. This fundamental difference is exactly why police shouldn't be addressing, addressing mental health or social issues related calls. Therefore, as 30% of all calls as Chief McPhee states are mental health or social issues related, then at least 30% of the police budget, the single largest line number in the city of Edmonton's budget, should be divested away from this institution and into social and mental health services. In addition, the president of the police association, Michael Elliott, denounced that there is systemic racism within the EPS in an interview with CBC. How does one then explain how indigenous women are 10 times more likely to be street checked than others? How do we explain the disproportionately overrepresented number of black and indigenous people in prisons and jails across all of Canada? The implicit racism continues, as Ray Cash Walters pointed out, when discussing the possibility of decreasing the police budget, Chief McPhee mentioned how the first thing to go would be programs brought in to address diversity within the police force. These are all very clear signs of systemic racism. So by now, you must have heard dozens, if not hundreds of testimonies, all stating the importance of defunding the police and investing in the community. You have invitingly re-traumatized people while asking them to justify their stance on pro-abolitionist beliefs. You have allowed for the oppression of our city's most marginalized people to continue by the hands of those who are supposed to be serving us. You cannot avert your eyes anymore. You must take a stance and you should feel the urgency for change. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you very much, Shengi. Next is uh, Rohit Gill. Hey, uh, thanks for having me today. So my name's Rohit, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm a recent graduate from the U of A living in Ellerslie. I'm here today to support this motion and to encourage council in going further to demilitarize the police and to invest into compassionate initiatives rather than draconian ones. At their base, uh, at their best, states and by extension, municipalities serve the interests of their constituents in ways markets often cannot. Unfortunately, I've seen a recent trend in governance that I would like to highlight for you today. Whether it be the federal government's proposal of a Serb snitch line, the province's introduction of Bill 1, or the city's excessive policing practices, it seems as though states and municipalities are taking a draconian approach to problems that necessitate compassionate solutions. Edmonton is not immune to this trend. Our police have engaged in discriminatory, unconstitutional carding practices that often target Black and Indigenous people. Our cities criminalize poverty by issuing fair vision tickets disproportionately to low-income and homeless populations. In many cases, mental health issues are responded to by the, by the police as well, despite officers not having the necessary training to deal with these issues appropriately. These draconian responses to systemic issues must stop. For the most part, policing is a band-aid solution to problems after they've already occurred. Our tax dollars will stretch much farther if we allocate them to preventative solutions. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Poverty is one of the strongest predictors of crime. By addressing poverty at its roots, we can also prevent crime in the city. So the shift from draconianism to compassion will require a shift in priorities and consequently a shift in budgeting. That means divesting from police, therefore demilitarizing police and investing in community development. It should be noted, however, that when we say divest from the police, we do not mean privatize the police. If anyone thinks this could be an opportunity for the city to introduce a sexy new P3 or public-private partnership, they are misguided. If you think this is an opportunity to leave officers hung out to dry without meaningful work or a living, you are also misguided. This is about having states and municipalities do what they do best take care of their constituents rather than police them at every moment. But what should this reallocation of resources entail? 
Well, we can start by shifting our budgets away from militarized policing and towards housing first initiatives, towards making Edmonton transit fare free, towards more 211 response and less 911 response, towards mental health and towards education. There's no reason our tax dollars should be going to armored vehicles rather than community development. The aspects of policing that we do like, such as detective work or responding to safety concerns in the middle of the night, should be universally accessible to all Edmontonians. There is no reason that uh, someone calling about a break and enter, uh, someone calling about a break and enter uh, in a more uh, diverse, poorer neighborhood should not be afforded the same care and attention as someone living in Westbrook. There are countless compassionate and preventative solutions to our city's problems. An Edmonton that chooses to adopt these solutions is an Edmonton that we can be proud to call home, regardless of our color, creed, or class. Thanks. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, was Ali Sitter able to join us? They were not. No? Okay. Frank Page? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Frank Page. Full Sorry disclosure, I'm a member of the Edmonton Police Service. I'm not going to tell a warm, fuzzy police story. One nice story about police does not negate someone else's negative story. I want to be respectful of other people's experiences that they're sharing. I will start it with a bit about my career so that people understand and have context for my views. I've been an active member for over 24 years. For over 10 years of that, I've specialized in violent interpersonal crime in the areas of child protection, threat assessment, domestic violence, and homicide. I have seen children and adults beaten, terrorized, sexually assaulted, and murdered. I have seen the worst of what people can do to each other. I tell you this to emphasize the point that society cannot police themselves. I would further argue that without well-trained officers, the vulnerable in society would feel terrified as there would be no one to stand in the gap between them and the people who prey upon them. But understanding criminogenic behavior about why offenders become offenders is extremely complicated. One underlying factor is often trauma as a youth, which could then manifest in substance abuse and antisocial personality uh, behaviors later in life. And this cycle of trauma is often passed on to their youth. I share this to demonstrate that criminogenic behavior is complex and not easy to fix and eliminate, and eliminating police does not help. I wholeheartedly agree with those who are saying that we need more resources to help both victims and offenders. Substance abuse treatment is one huge aspect. It breaks my heart to see our youth, our young people in the throes of addiction and being helpless to intervene. I cannot force them into drug treatment. I can and do offer them resources, but I cannot force them. Trauma and counseling treatment are critical but hard to obtain for offenders outside of an incarceration setting. Victim counseling is expensive and long-term, and often victims simply do not have the financial resources. I say this because there is so much as a community we can do to help people before they ever intersect with the criminal justice system. I would love for citizens of Edmonton to pull together, address criminogenic vulnerabilities within our city and our communities, and eventually reduce the need for police. I would love to be worked out of my job. This is a debate that's about 10 years ahead of its time. There is so much community work to be done first. To reduce funding now is like asking people to walk a tightrope without a net. Let's do the other work first, reduce the risk to our communities, and revisit this debate down the road. In the meantime, how do we better serve you? I've been listening to some of the stories of pain and marginalization that people have shared, and I empathize with you. These experiences are important for us to learn our communities better so that we can serve you better. I agree with the gentleman who spoke on Monday, the criminal lawyer, that education for all of society, including police, is critical in fighting racism. In the 24 years I have lived in Edmonton, I have seen massive changes in my community. We are so much more diverse now in ethnicity, cultures, and lifestyles. While this diversity creates a rich fabric for our community, it also creates challenges for public service. Sometimes it's hard for us to catch up, and sometimes we fumble the ball. We need you to work with us to make it for this to be a success. Being a female in a male dominated environment has been a challenge. I choose to work within the system to facilitate change. I am currently one of the few female watch commanders, uh, staff sergeants within the Edmonton Police Service. I am one of the commanding officers in our patrol branch. It has not been an easy road for me. 
When I was first hired, there were very few females within the service, but now I see more and more women not only hired, but in positions of leadership. We are using our backgrounds and experience to make EPS stronger and more effective within our community. I'm enormously proud to say that Nathan Kennedy, who spoke on Monday, is under my command. He is a man of character, passion, and ethics. His troubled youth influenced his development, but it was his personal choices that determined his character. Nathan is so humble that he would be the last one to tell you that he's not simply a cop. He is already a leader. He has and is currently training the next generation of police. He is being that change that he spoke about and that I hear people calling for. I join my voice to many others in a call to end racism and discrimination. It has no place in our society. But racism is a people problem, not simply a police problem. We have to tackle racism and discrimination at a societal level. I look to our youth. I am troubled that we segregate our use in various schools according to religion, culture, and socioeconomic status. I truly believe that when our children begin to play together and parents get to know one another, we only can realize that we actually have more similarities than we do differences. And those differences need not be feared, but rather celebrated. Finally, my primary concern about the events that have transpired in Edmonton and across North America is that people are addressing racism and discrimination in a very divisive way. I see so much more impact and effectiveness if we come together. I would love to see bridges being built, not torn down. Thank, Thank you. you, Staff Sergeant Page. Uh, next is, uh, was Mary Howe able to join us? They were not. Were, uh, do we have any other speakers who were previously registered who've been able to join us, or are we on our last? This should be the last on the panel. Okay, Brittany Rudick, you have the last word. Among the panelists, at least. There's a lot more discussion to be had, but uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Brittany Reddick. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm here to speak in favor of defunding, demilitarizing, and ultimately abolishing the Edmonton Police Service in solidarity with Black Lives Matter Edmonton. I am a Métis Ukrainian woman born and raised on Treaty 6, and I currently reside in Amiskwache, Waskahagan, colonially known as Edmonton. I'm a survivor of sexual violence, and I also am an acting president and founder of a grassroots anti-sexual violence initiative in Edmonton, aimed at addressing this issue in the arts communities predominantly, but that's obviously expanded during current events. Um, and I'll speak today mostly about my experience with reporting my sexual assault and my experience with the criminal justice system. I reported my sexual assault in November 2017 to EPS, which was undoubtedly one of the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make. Survivors often don't come forward because they are afraid of not being believed um, or taken seriously, and especially if they are in a marginalized position, if they're Black, if they're Indigenous, the fear runs deep because of the systemic racism that police and law enforcement have been pushing forward on marginalized communities for decades. Um, and the police don't do a really good job of handling sexual assaults. The Globe and Mail reported in 2017 that across Canada, one in five sexual assault claims were labeled baseless, which essentially shows me as a survivor that my voice doesn't matter and what happened to me and my trauma doesn't matter. And that doesn't include the number of people who are afraid to speak out about their trauma and their experience with sexual violence. Again, predominantly indigenous black women and two-spirit queer community members. And as a white presenting woman, uh, going through this process was undoubtedly different than someone who was visibly racialized. Despite that, the police still made me feel um, demeaned, dehumanized, intimidated, and re-traumatized. The entire process was extremely difficult. Um, there was not a lot of support given to me during my time um, reporting and going through the criminal justice system. And I feel like that adds uh, an additional layer of trauma into survivors' experiences on top of the trauma of their initial assault or experience. And this is if the police will take you seriously in the first place. And the power imbalance between police and community members creates a hierarchy in which survivors have to place themselves in vulnerable positions to be heard, which undoubtedly increases the risk, especially for Black and Indigenous community members. 
I'm a huge advocate for transformative justice um, as a survivor of sexual violence and as someone who works with survivors in the community. And I feel that survivors would be way better served by fellow community members to address harms experienced. Immediately repealing the $75 million promised to the EPS would create so many opportunities for our communities to strengthen valuable skill sets within each other's relationships and bystander intervention training, transformative restorative justice practices, trauma-informed response to sexual violence, and so much more. Community care for survivors of trauma is only possible without the presence of police in our community. I believe we can all learn these skills to better manage sexual violence so that Black, and migrant, Indigenous, and queer voices are centered in these conversations and they're protected and granted justice in a way that feels empowering to them. The current system, both the EPS and the criminal justice system at large, do not empower survivors, which is made most obvious by the lack of justice and ongoing violence against Indigenous women and girls. If the police and the RCMP were very integral to justice, as we're led to believe and we're socialized to believe, then why is there still nothing being done for thousands of lives lost to sexualized colonial violence? We deserve properly trained, compassionate care for all members of our community and defunding and abol abolishing and demilitarizing the EPS would create space for such an empowering and just way of existing together. I stand with Black Lives Matter and their calls to reinvest the budget into new infrastructure, never vote for an increase to the EPS budget, and a repeal to the $75 million promised in 2019 to support mental health initiatives, community initiatives, and creating safer living conditions for those in need. We do not need the police, we need each other, we need resources, and we need to listen to marginalized voices. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, all members of this panel and all of the prior speakers who we've heard from. Um, I think more than 150 uh, altogether. Um, but we're not done just yet. We have questions from members of council. So far I have Councillor Walters, Councillor Henderson, Councillor Banga, and Councillor McKean in the queue. Councillor Walters, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I wanted to start with Ms. Page, uh, although I don't see her in the screen. So. Uh, maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, is it? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. I just, the camera's backwards, so you can't see me. Okay. Um, to the other side. A, a question that might put, put you on the spot a little bit. Uh, okay. That's okay. Uh, I <laughs> asked uh, to a EPS member earlier in the hearing, uh, if you were able to tell us uh, in a couple minutes or less a story about a time that you had to stand up to racism. Uh, in the service and how difficult that was to do? Uh, you know, I, it's interesting. It's a very interesting question. And I would have to preface it by saying, I think my reputation precedes me in dealing with my fellow members because I don't see it a whole lot. And But I also think that people don't behave like that around me because they know what I stand for. So I can't think of a specific example off the top of my head. Um, I'm not going to deny that it happens, but... And then, so for those that may be forced to stand up to it or willing to stand up to it, how easy for them do you think it is to stand up to it? I think it's getting easier. When I first got on, like I said, I've been on for 24 years. Um, I think the culture and the environment today is much more... Um, open for us to have that interaction with each other and the checks and balances are much, it's much easier to do that today, certainly than it was 24 years ago. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's fine. I appreciate it. Uh, um, Mr. Gill, I wanted to ask you, you, you provided some warning of not, even if we defund the publicly funded police, we shouldn't privatize. Uh, don't you think if the, uh, police, the public investments in policing were, were removed, that there would be a surge in private security uh, being utilized across our society. Do you think that would be a reaction to that? Um, I'm trying to warn against that. So, right, but our control over that is our control over is the publicly funded police budget not necessarily over a proliferation of 
private security, which we already see to some degree. Uh, I mean, you you would be able to decide on whether to use like P3s, right? We would be able to. Right. Well, yeah, we, we would have. So even if we didn't, I'm saying there would very possibly be a significant increase in. Yeah, so my, my point is to it, rather than put that money towards bidding on contracts for private security would be to put that money towards preventative solutions, right? So that you reduce crime in other ways. I understand that. Yeah. I, I, my, my worry is is that that would result in significant uh, utilization of private uh, law enforcement of the security companies, et cetera. But we could... Talk about that later, Ms. Uh, more, more, and I wanted to ask you a question. As someone who's long established in your community and, and knows your community uh, very well, if this council uh, was to take steps uh, to begin abolishing police, say, uh, what do you think the reaction would be to that, uh, say, in the next municipal election? I think you'd see a lot of houses going up for sale. I think there's a real concern. I think there's a real concern if we abolish police that the people that are have moved in, that are part of the change, that want to be part of the change. I, I mean, Michael, I mean, you know, right? I mean, what the, what the neighborhood was 15, 16, 17 years ago without the community policing model. If we drastically change it, it is going to go back down, uh, down a hill. And I think that's a real concern. I was talking with uh, uh, one of the Indigenous groups in our neighbourhood that we're really close with. I don't want to name names because she can speak when she when she's able to. But uh, we were talking about it and we we're very concerned if there is a, a drastic change, the, uh, the, the the big supports, the infrastructure pieces. I will I will uh, close. Thank you for that, Ms. Moran. Ms. Uh, Paige, I'll go back to you uh, for my last question. You talked about building bridges. Uh, mm -hmm. that to happen, what would you say is the first bridge and most important bridge that needs to be built that isn't there today? I would say that the, um, the, the members or the people who have spoken up in these forums, I think it's critical to hear their voice. I think it's critical to build those bridges with people who feel like they've been hurt and marginalized by police. Um, we need to hear them and we need to hear you know, where things have gone wrong and how we can do better and come to the table with them. Okay. I think this forms a great example of where we can start for sure. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I think I'll go first to Ms. Uh, Chernenkov because uh, I was interested in your um, discussion of, of culture. Um, and and uh, and and how you change culture, and and, uh, and the need to shock a system in order to do that. Um, but I'm 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 my my worrying Actually, concern is those here. Are the words of Steve McPhee, but yes, you do need okay, to shock. Okay, sure. To change yeah. culture. Um, yeah. Um, so um, I, I'm I my what I'm what I'm curious about is. You know th that you could defund and actually not create that culture shock. Um, exactly. So, what you know in your mind? Because I actually do think that that's a challenge that faces us right now. And I, I think partly we are dealing with a system. And I think this point has been made to us again and again and again, where the police are doing exactly what um, traditional society has been asking to do, um, and that part we part of what we need to do is really figure out what we do need them to do as opposed to what that's about. So if you're going to shock a system, if you're going to change culture, um, what other mechanisms and tools are there to make sure that you actually get to that change? Because I, I think that's the fundamental question we need to deal with here. Uh, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox to do that, everything from language to funding to, to <laughs> so many tools but it really has to come from the top. If there is no buy-in by the main stakeholders, and here, although we're talking City of Edmonton councillors, we're also talking about the um, Edmontonians that you're hearing from. And so in order to change culture, you have to make the understanding that you need two different types of cultures to deal with the problems that are being addressed. Uh, the good-bad, 
right-wrong culture that the police have is important. But there's also a, I can see shades of gray, gray and I can do um, some problem-solving that is creative, is also impro- a- absolutely crucial. And that's what we're hearing today. Yeah, and I, I guess that I'm, I worry that we have been asking the police to do the wrong thing, fundamentally the wrong thing. And the, the, the culture that's built up has been as a response to that. Um, and, I, and that's, you know, I, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to grapple with. And maybe this is a question uh, uh, to, to Ms. Paje as well, um, that, you know, that how do you, because we've been making incremental change for as long as I can remember, and yet nothing seems to really fundamentally change. So, can I just focus that one more time? Yeah. Sure. It's a question of do you control public safety or do you resolve public safety issues? Those are the two questions on the table, and we need both. Okay. Right. Sorry. Uh, uh, Sorry. Yeah, um, Sergeant. Sergeant, did you did you have any thoughts about that question of how you you know push push for the kind of really fundamental change that it sounds like you stand for? Sorry, was that addressed to me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Can you repeat the question? Well, I'm just, I'm wondering the same, you know, that, that what, what it, you know, we have been nibbling at the edges of this for so long. The story is not changing. Um, and it feels like there's an opportunity here for some fundamental change in what we expect police to do and how we expect them to do it and what their relationship is. I think it's something that sounds like you already believe in. So how do you, what are the tools that we need to really shake things up enough to make sure that we get the substantial change we need in that culture? That's a great question. So um, I think in combination with Nathan Kennedy's um, presentation on Monday, I think he's a critical example of how we can facilitate that change. Um, policing at the core of it is a people um, is a people occupation. We are we rely heavily on interpersonal experience. So the days of hiring cookie cutter cops is over, and diversity is critical. And as a staff sergeant downtown. I, it's wonderful for me to see diversity becoming more and more a part of our personnel. I have people from all walks of life joining our crews, and that's the critical part of um, creating that change that we're talking about. It, it takes time, and I'll be honest with you, it takes time, and we take and it takes training, and connecting up with the community, not just diversity within our membership, but also connecting with those critical community. Um, people out there that can impact and that we can bounce ideas off of and and get that input into how we do things better is also another aspect of it. Great, thanks. I wish I could go on, but I've run out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Councillor Banga. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go straight to questions. Uh, Mr. Gill, question for you. Over the last four uh, days, it's been said over and over again that police, 30% of the calls uh, that pers- uh, police respond to, they're not police calls, okay? And you, I'm pretty sure you agree. Um, but please tell me a mechanism. When a call comes in to uh, 911 or uh, whatever the police number is, uh, uh, people do not say that my loved one is having mental issues. People say, I'm having trouble with my my brother, my sister, or whoever else. Could you be able to tell me how do we distinguish what this call is eventually going to be? I'm getting uh, thrown some hard balls here, but I'll try my best. Um, I mean, that will take training. I, I like the idea of of officers working with mental health workers and trying to read those cues as best as they can. Because um, currently it's not happening. Uh, there was the recent death of a man who was schizophrenic, who was shot at. That's a clear-cut thing that shouldn't happen. Um, but it does time and time again. Um, I think sh- uh, Shiny has some experience with uh, answering some calls. So she might be able to speak to it uh, in more detail about uh, ways 
in which to respond and ways in which to pick up on those cues. Um, so I'd, I'd love to defer to her if she'd be willing. Um, no, I'll ask you another question. Sure. Um, uh, like a lot of people said, uh, you know, on the social issues, uh, homelessness, poverty, uh, mental health, they're all going to help. I mean, you know, if we take care of them. And uh, again, you also mentioned uh, free transit fares. In your mind, did the crime and disorder uh, went down in the last three months because we had free transit? Uh, the point is to not criminalize somebody for not being able to afford a service that should be free in the first place. Uh, I just wanted to touch on, on the other question you asked. I think that we should make it more clear to people that 211 is an avenue that with they, they can respond, that that they can utilize. And most people, because the the police are so pervasive in society, we, we only think to to uh, call 911. We need to make 211 more accessible. We need to have uh, people working at 211 that can respond to issues better than 911, uh, better than the police. Um, but, but going to transit. That's just one example of the city's first instinct being policing. How can we criminalize this? How can we find people? What We should be looking at ways to to provide people services. You know, at the end of the day, that's what municipalities do the best. And that's a better Edmonton in my eyes. Thank you. Staff Sergeant I'm going to pull up with the same question to you when a call comes in i just want you to kind of explain the nature of it if uh are you there yeah i'm still here yep i'm just waiting for you to finish your uh question there uh, no it's exactly the same question how do we okay do we decide how we respond okay so the information that's shared on any 911 call or any call to the complaint line, um, we glean all that information as carefully as possible. Our evaluators are trained up in our communications department to ask certain questions that would help us to determine what the best way to respond is. Oftentimes, we don't know what's on the other end of that call. Um, we don't know what we're walking into. Um, so we, our first avenue is to assess first and, and get that information. We also have, if we've been to that location in the past, we, we look into um, past events that have been there to help us have a deeper understanding of what the situation is that we're walking into. Um, when we get there, we have options depending on what we see. We have to, we talk to people, we look at the circumstance, we look at the surroundings, and then um, when possible or when appropriate, we call in our partner agency. So if it's a mental health call, we will uh, contact our PACT area, which is police combined with uh, a mental health nurse. I love working with our partners and our partners make us strong and diversified as well. And that is, is critical in how we do business and better serve our communities and working with our partners. So. To, to the crux of it, we don't know what we're walking into when we first get there. And our first priority is, is um, everyone's safety. And then from there, we try to get people help. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, do I have more time left or uh, I'm is it done? I'm afraid it's expired, but thank you. Thank you. Next is Councillor McKean. Thank you. And uh, Brittany Rudick, I'm going to praise you. Uh, you could, to give you a moment's time to unmute. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you uh, for your leadership today and courage and vulnerability. Uh, I thought it was uh, it was uh, very, very hard to hear what you went through. But I wanted to ask you about, in a case of a sexual assault, um, I think uh, it would be a pretty common attitude that we'd want the bad guy caught and punished. Um, and you talked about transformative justice. How could that apply in a, in a case of a sexual assault? Can you, can you run me through that so I understand your thinking on that? 
Certainly. Um, thank you for the acknowledgement of my experience too. It sucked. Um, so the work that I do with Spawn, the nonprofit that I run and collaborate on with um, several community members, um, essentially a survivor will come to us and seek that service. And so what restorative and transform transformative justice seeks to do is holistically address harm. And so rather than the ultimate punitive measures that we're so used to and we're so entrenched in by demanding punishment and um, uh, someone going to jail for a sexual assault, we would rather seek to create some sort of healing and reparative process within that relationship. And so the survivor would come to our group and seek for support and we would um, reach out if it's safe to do so, of course, to the perpetrator of harm. And if that person is also so willing to engage in this process, hold themselves accountable and learn about how they can undo those ingrained propensities for violence, then we would do some sort of either a talking circle. And all of this is rooted very, very deeply in Indigenous practice. And so led by Indigenous leaders, ideally, this would be a really wonderful idea to build some sort of program with them. Um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen restorative justice right. carried out two or three times. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it would ever apply in, in the area of sex crimes, though, to be honest. It's very I, I, hard to do. Like, there, there are certain examples, like Dalhousie University, for example, is a great um, uh, story who used restorative justice in a way that created a lot of backlash, unfortunately, in the community. But uh, I think it's because of our socialized nature. We're trained to want to seek punishment instead of growth and healing from a perpetrator, which I believe to be very possible. Um, I think we want to see that revenge. So I think in the public, it was the wrong call. But I know the survivors, from what I've read and researched following that instance of use of restorative justice with sexual violence, it was very much... Um, healing for them because it didn't result in the trauma of going through the criminal justice system, which was a whole nother story I could talk your ear yeah. off about, but yeah. uh, I think it's possible. I think it's so possible. It is, it is a mind blowing concept. And a lot of the um, submissions this week we've had have been mind blowing, to be honest. And I think that's probably a good place to start for, for a lot of us to have had our minds blown. Um, um, I, I just, yeah, I needed to say that. I really, really appreciate the submissions. And again, to you, Miss Ruddick or Rudick, I hope I, I probably mispronouncing. I just wanted to thank you again. We've had a number of women come forward this week and talk about their own sexual assaults. Tremendous courage to do that. And, and maybe your leadership will help to destigmatize that as well. For the, for the individuals, which should happen. So thank you very much. Thanks, all of you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you again to everyone who has uh, presented uh, in this panel and, and all of the panels. Um, it, was, uh, it was Eli, Eli Tompkins, correct? Sorry, I forgot to, uh, it was Eli, yes. thank you. Sorry, I just, I wanted to ask, and, you know, we've heard from some people who, who have expressed concern about the notion of defunding or shifting resources or a variety of things. We, we've we also heard, so from some of those folks, we have heard, and I think we did hear it in the panel, and, and the desire to see if there's a way to build bridges. And I guess... I wanted to hear from you. Do you do you feel that's possible anymore for yourself? Like, because I, I, I've heard from a lot of speakers today that it really doesn't, or from really the last two weeks, that for many people, based off their experiences, they don't they don't feel like that's worth their time anymore. And I wanted to maybe put that to you and get your thoughts on that, and if if you're comfortable with that question. Yeah, um, I personally, I don't think I would want to talk to police about what happened. Um, they failed my family. They failed me. Um, we, we only got a couple emails about the whole situation. Um, it's, I think, in situations like mine and so many other people, 
they don't want to build bridges again because they've been hurt so bad. They just don't trust the police and me and my family don't trust the police anymore. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, and, you know, I, know, I acknowledge, I know through, through this, I've generally tried to ask those who, who may not normally come to public hearings. Uh, I am going to break that this moment just to maybe ask Staff Sergeant, uh, it was Page, I believe. And I do want to sort of put that similar question in, in reverse to you, which is that something I have heard the last two weeks, and it's been hard to hear, is that people feel f that the system has failed them. And to be clear, that's not just policing. That's, I mean, people have said to me that I have failed them in my seven years on council by not doing anything, that, that there are many people in leadership roles that have failed them for too long and don't even want to bother coming to the table because in some ca people's cases, they came to the table, they put forward information, they suggested that they, they've done these things. And, and I think this is a question I want to be able to ask, you know, when, when we get to questions of, of the commission and the chief as well, but just because you have been on the force for a while, do you, well, how do you respond to that when you have a desire to build those bridges and, and we have people who feel like, and again, I'm putting myself in this, that, that we have failed people and, and how do we, is it pause? I mean, what's what's your reaction, and, and how would you see us trying to address that? Well, first of all, um, I want to thank Eli for being so honest and sharing his heart. Um, I'm sorry that that uh, you feel this way, and it, it breaks my heart that you have you feel disappointed in um, in what. Uh, in your interaction with police. And that, that's disheartening for us. And I, and I apologize for that. How do we build those bridges? Um, I think it would be working with the communities first. So if Eli is not willing to, or not able to, not um, to put words in his mouth, but if he's not able to come to the table with us, then I think it's important to start building those bridges with the community that he does trust, or, or um, sorry, I missed your pronouns, um, Eli, so sorry if I um, insult you. Um, so I think it's important to build bridges with the communities um, that are in a position of trust. And maybe perhaps in that way, we can build those relationships until there is trust developed. Um, I would love to sit down and talk with Eli at some point in time. I would love to hear more um, but I, I totally understand um, not being in a position of trusting, and, and I respect that. So I think building the relationship with communities that that um, that Eli does trust, I think, is a critical first step. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe a, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I forgot to start my timer. How how am I doing? You got time for one more. Okay, um, Miss Morin, I wanted to ask you a question because in a similar light, but you come at it from a a different angle because you've been working to build up and and revitalize the community that you've been living in for some time. We've heard from community members, even within the neighborhoods that are around there, who said similar things, that they feel like it's not worth their time to come to the table, who don't feel safe, and, and may not even be coming out to these events then. Do you have any thoughts around how how we address that? If there are people who don't even want to come out to an event, what What's the possibility to try to try with that and, and to, to engage people? It's a real struggle, right? It's really difficult to get people to come out if they don't feel safe. So I think the big thing is feeling safe. And I know myself when um, I was not at all a spokesperson in any way for community when we moved in 26 years ago. Actually, we huddled down and kept thinking, how can we move out of here? And it wasn't until a neighbor reached out and said, come to one of the meetings you know, it's a great place, your voice will be heard. And it was a revite meeting. And it was at the very beginning. And then I came out. So I think often it's that one on one contact that helps bring those people out. Um, and you're exactly right, there are people in the community that haven't come out to events or to initiatives. Um, and that's why we're trying to get it down to the local level. That's why we're doing the back alley parties and doing door knocking. I mean, it was like going back to the old days of door knocking to say, hey, we're your Eastwood neighbor. How's it going? And out of that, like we were able to actually work with the social workers, work with the police, being able to do food security with a food 
bank. Um, and all of a sudden it turned into this much more than just a community party, but it was really door to door knocking, Andrew. And so that was a lot of work, but it was well worth it because all of a sudden these people are now connecting to each other. Um, and some didn't, right? Some just came for a hot dog and that was, that was what they wanted. Um, but it is a real, it's a real mountain to climb. So I think it's just like, door to door, right? It's it's that really connecting people to people and them feeling safe with their neighbors. And if they don't feel safe, then they're not going to come out. So um, so it's it's a struggle. Okay. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to everyone again. Uh, I would love to be able to ask all of you questions. We have one round, five minutes each. So um, I think I will ask uh, Shiny if you're still there. Uh, the first question I've got. Nope. Sorry. Um, so this has been a very difficult conversation and, and I think sometimes uh, there's been confusion, deep confusion uh, around this conversation about what we are looking at. Some people think that um, there's going to be this sudden uh, disappearance of all law and order overnight, which is obviously, obviously not something council would ever do. And then there seems to be this idea that uh, um, all of the expertise that has been gained uh, by all of the professional people who have worked in, in all, of the, all of these areas of, of, uh, of, of the uh, service, that all of that's going to get thrown out too if something changes, which is obviously, obviously not the case. We would never get rid of anything that helps us. So... My question for you is about systems and structures. There are good people in the system, but the system itself is not good to people. And so what we're talking about is changing the structure of the system and transforming it into something that helps everyone. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, being someone who's like, Talk to people in times of crisis. If we don't change these systems and if we don't change the structure, are we really realistically going to make a positive difference in all those people who are suffering in, in their lives? Councillor, can you turn this one into a question? I, I thought that was a question mark at the end of it. Okay. And who is it directed towards? That was for Shiny. Okay. Because she's right. the one who's been dealing one on one with people in a way that, that we would hope that we could reach out to people. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Shiny. Um, so, yeah, I agree. A system change is very important. And when I mean, like, take what I was talking about or alluding to earlier was not just completely abolishing the police right off the bat. Um, and there are people, especially in the police force, that do have um, specialized care, especially in mental health, as was mentioned earlier, like the PAC team. Um, and that's important. And more police officers should get mental health training. Um, however, some police officers aren't equipped to be dealing with mental health, maybe because of their own past trauma or otherwise. And so, especially when talking to people um, in the distress line and all the callers that come in, uh, they've been dealing with these with these mental issues for a long periods of time. And so, it's like finally they hit uh, the point where they just have a crisis situation, and that's when they call. Or sometimes they call. Um, just because they need, need emotional support at the time. And so what it's been made, what's been made clear to me is the fact that they need ongoing mental health support that we just as a crisis team aren't able to give uh, all the time and therefore counseling services should be provided by the state if possible. Um, so yeah, I'm saying that a system change is necessary and in terms of divesting, I just mean that we need to divest more to the communities in terms of mental health resources so that preventative change can be um, in place in instead of punitive justice. Thank you for that. And as I end, I just want to honor and thank all the people who come up to speak to us and share the, who shared their pain, 
their thoughts, their ideas, their hopes, their anger, and uh, their joy. Uh, this has been uh, quite the journey, and uh, we are all truly humbled. And thank you, everyone. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Councilor Paquette, if you could take the chair. I have the chair. So, first of all, Eli, thank you for, uh, oh, thank you to all of our panelists, but Eli, that's a heartbreaking story and, and difficult, I'm sure, to relive. Um, what, and I think there's a consistent theme uh, from a number of the comments here about the appropriate response in the case of um, uh, calls that require mental health uh, interventions and, and what's the right support. If, if we were to, and I'll ask the same question to Shiny in a minute, but first to you, Eli, um, can you imagine a scenario where uh, a variety of people from a variety of agencies come to respond to um, situations that might include police or they might all come in the same car but they might report to different agencies or the same agency but some of them might be officers, some of them might be public health nurses, some of them might be social workers. Um, in your mind, is there, is there is there an appropriate way for your community's agencies to show up in a way that would be safe, but that also is safe for those frontline workers, uh, depending on what they might encounter? Yeah, I think if, um, if someone came to see me and my family and I knew that they have worked with people that... Um, have been affected by police or um, people who work with minorities, I think I would feel safe with them because they know, um, they know about the um, bad things that the police does. Um, I, yeah, I just don't think I would directly talk to a police officer or someone that directly um, talks with the police. But I think if someone from like a different agency talked to me, I would um, feel free to talk to them. Well, that's that's helpful. And uh, same question to Shiny. Um, I agree with Eli. I too agree that having a different assortment of people coming coming uh, in response to a crisis situation is better than just having the police themselves. Um, and especially because they seem a little threatening or some people might be afraid of how they look, they might not be willing to open up, um, especially when they're dealing with a very sensitive situation. Now, if a vehicle of whatever color with whatever stripes on it shows up and it has two people in it, one of whom is a traditional police officer and one of whom is a, a mental health worker and they happen to arrive in the same car and the initial contact is the mental health worker, social worker and the police officer is the backup in that case. Is that a model that you think can be made to work or, or could be safe? Um, I'm not sure of all the models that are out there, so I can't assess it um, properly, but um, I have heard of a situation in which um, a person was um, um, thinking of dying by suicide and police did come to the spot and they parked the car far away and then they didn't turn off the, the alarm or their siren and um, they walked to the situation. So something like that would be beneficial. So, well, yeah. That's... Sorry, I don't know if that properly answered your question. No, no, that's okay. I mean, I, I think it. I think your answer honors the complexity of the 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 many different situations that community safety workers. Uh, may encounter. So, and I I can't read my own notes. I apologize. Somebody mentioned the Yukon model. Um, I did. Lou Chernikov. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, I've done a little bit of reading about that. Now that seems like an interesting in-between where, where those folks are empowered as, as officers, their community safety officers in the Kwanlin Dunn CSO program. Um, do you think that that, you know, is it possible, and this is from a governance and culture point of view, so I, I'm, I'm glad that it's you in the context of everything else that you said, could a community safety service in safely include traditional police responding to higher intensity calls, community service off uh, safety officers like the Yukon model, and mental health workers all reporting and dispatched in an integrated way? Or do you think, it would that be a dramatic enough kind of change to show that we've heard? Or, or do you th still think that it actually has to be even further than that? Um, I have questions about scaling the Yukon model, and that's why my personal view is I think that the two separate culture, there are two separate cultures needed to deal with the two separate issues. And the problem is keeping the good, bad, um, yes, no, black, white culture, oh, excuse the pun there, um, with a shades of gray problem solver um, kind of culture there has to be a kind of separation between those. Um, I think they have to work together and bridge community together. The question is, how do we <laughs> um, how do we create a situation? And I understand where you're coming from in your questioning that you can still send an officer along with them. I'm not sure that the same car model might be right, um, but. There has to be an acceptance by the police of a, of a shades of gray kind of person problem solver, and there has to be acceptance by the problem solvers, shades of gray kind of people, of the black, white, right, wrong culture of the police. And I think that you'll get the best results by recognizing that there are two different types of ways of dealing with the situation. And for me, that comes from edu educating Edmontonians. It may require a, um, a television commercial kind of thing, um, but it it needs to. E we need to educate Edmontonians that if you're dealing with mental health issues, this can be the direction instead of the police that they have other options. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm out of time. I want to follow up on that, but I'm afraid I'm out of time. Um, I, I, I also wanted to uh, thank and didn't get a chance. Uh, uh, Ms. Rudick for her um, uh, her advocacy and, and commentary and vulnerability echoing what, what Councillor McKean had said and from all of our panelists uh, all through all 12 panels. So I just want to check to see if there are any uh, other uh, questions from members of Council. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I may just say um, I Hamilton, just want to thank ahead. everybody who uh, came out in the past two weeks to speak. Uh, I've, I haven't asked a question. I took this as an opportunity to, to listen and to learn. Um, and, and it's been a really humbling experience. So I just wanted to relay my gratitude to all of the speakers who have come out to speak to us. Thank you for that, Councillor Hamilton. I feel the same way. Uh, and I think most members of council do. Um, any, any other Questions or closing comments of gratitude? Not Mr. Mayor. Oh, is Attic? If, if I can make a comment, yeah, I, I echo what Councillor Hamilton just said. It's been uh, very enlightening for me. Uh, I've really, it's, I don't know what the word is because it's definitely not enjoyed, um, but I've, I've really appreciated listening to everyone. And I think everyone has brought. Uh, a perspective worthy of consideration um, and to the public that's listening that that knows our process we, we will now consider what you've all said um, and reflect upon it for a few more d days before we get a chance to debate the motion on the floor so uh, please know that your uh, concerns have been noted uh, by myself and I'm sure other councillors so thank you for taking uh, part in this uh, process as elected representatives, we really like to hear from the public, and this has been a, a great venue for that. I'm also appreciative of the clerks that have uh, put this all 
together and the, and the mayor for chairing this. Um, I think it's been a fairly effective format uh, given what we're, we're dealing with with technology here. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Mayor, I know I've asked a lot of questions, but if uh, you would indulge me a little bit. Well, the others, I'm, I'm not going to open speaking or debate on it. Uh, 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 folks who hadn't asked questions, I think, had said a few things. But I, th I think, strictly speaking, if you were to begin to speak, I would need a motion for that. So I'm given a little bit of latitude here. Uh, I'm, I'm, prob I'm, I'm at risk of being called to order as it is. So, so, so I, I think we'll all have more to say about this all next week. Uh, and, and we have other channels to comment in the meantime and be asked by our constituents and the media about our reactions. So I, I think we should probably stop there. Um, uh, so what we do need to do, uh, again, final thank you to the panelists today. Um, what we do need to do now is uh, refer the motion on the floor to the... Um, uh, to be the 9.30 a.m. item of business on June 30th. Yeah, so it's to the June 29th, 30th Pardon meeting, me. and then it'll be time-specific for 9.30, and we'll send that in the chat right now. Okay, someone want to move that? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Banga, seconded by Councillor McKean. Okay, so I think we can uh, move, uh, uh, pardon me, we can vote on referral and while that voting is happening just to narrate what that means for our, uh, the public following along um, we will resume questions um, first and then uh, get into uh, debate on any amendments that come forward in the motion itself um, which will likely run well into the day and potentially beyond the one day that is set aside for this. So have we got all the votes? Yes. We have 13. Display the vote. So referral is passed. Uh, one last item of business uh, before I adjourn this um, Part of the process, which is some adjustments to the council calendar uh, for next week. Um, so I need a, uh, and this is just in order to set a very specific time specific for the Yellowhead uh, Freeway Trail con conversion consideration of inquiry officers report relative to the expropriation. It's very important that we set a specific time and meeting space for that. So I need a motion to. Um, uh, waive the notice requirements to make a schedule change. Someone would be so sure. moved. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton, seconded by Councillor Banga, I believe. Please vote to uh, permit changes to the uh, or to waive notice so that we can make a schedule adjustment. Yeah. We have 13. Thank you. Display the vote. Notice is waived. And then can I get someone to move that the orders of the day for the June 29th, 2020 City Council meeting be changed to recess at 345 with continuation on June 30th, 2020 from 9.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. So that would be for the normal council business. And uh, it needs to be a separate meeting for uh, some technical reasons. And it would be then that a special city council meeting be held on June 29th, 2020 from 4.15 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. to deal with the approval of expropriations, Yellowhead Trail Freeway conversion, Yellowhead Trail Freeway conversion, pardon me, consideration of inquiry officer's report for 12560 Fort Road and the council hear from the public on this matter. Um, so moved. Thank you, Councillor Essinger, okay. seconded by Councillor McKean. And just to explain a tiny bit more, normally we would deal with this at an executive committee meeting, um, but because we're not having those, we need to create a special forum, and it's better if it's separate from the rest of council business. And so a special council meeting is uh, clerk and law's advice for the right place to have a very focused conversation uh, on a statutorily defined um, uh, hearing relative to the inquiry officer's report. So um, 
It's the same time held in your calendar. The break would simply be a little bit later than normal. Questions, Councillor? Are there any questions on that? Not seeing any, then please vote to make these schedule changes. Yes. We're missing one vote. And that's one. 13. Okay, we have 13 votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Okay. Um, is this a notice of motion opportunity? I'll call for notices. Are there any notices of motion at this time? Seeing none, then this uh, meeting is adjourned. However, the matters discussed herein will, will pick up 9.30 a.m. Uh, next Tuesday. Thank you again, everyone.